Hey there students, it's James here from The Ever Learner. Thanks for taking a look at this video. We've got nearly four hours of content for you here for the A-level physical education physiological components. Just be aware that the biomechanics part we've kind of separated out and is in a separate video. Have a look at that, have a look for that. It'll be in the description below as well. Now, talking of the description, all of the notes pages for today's session are just down there in the description. Click on those links, print those off, and get yourself ready to take this session. Now, if you don't want to take four hours of teaching on one guy, I'm not sure I would either, you can have a look below in the description and you can see the jump to links for all of the different pieces of content. It should be super useful for you, so go and have a look at that, okay? So, four hours of material is going to get you super exam ready. Let's go. Okay, and I think we're ready to go. So we're going to sort of strike at the heart of muscles and movement here. So let's get on with it straight away. As we know, the person we're interested in this particular moment is Josh. He's a sprinter, and we're going to sort of, I guess, look at the sort of notion of sprinting and some movement and some muscles in a bit of detail here. So first things first, my focus with you guys today is I'm going to talk to you about the hip, and I'm going to talk to you about the ankle. Of course, I am not covering every muscle group every joint that you guys need to have a solid understanding of that is your job that is the job you're going to do with your teachers and you guys must make sure that you're doing exactly that thing what i want to do is i want to give you some absolutely superb knowledge on this stuff so that you can sort of apply that directly here and look for equivalent levels of knowledge elsewhere let's start with the hip first of all and really what i want to do here is i want to make sure that it, although we're looking at kind of uh, bone, uh, sorry, muscles here and movement. I want to make sure that we know what our articulations or our joints are. First things first, let me introduce you to the ilium. Okay, the ilium. The ilium is what we might loosely call the pelvis here. I'd like you to use the word ilium if you can. Pelvis is fine if not. We've also, of course, here, we've also got the femur. But specifically, we're looking at this part of the femur up here sort of like the head of the femur up here. And I'd like you, if you're able to, I'd like you to start referring to this as the femoral head. Let me write over here for you. The femoral, the femoral head. And that is the part of the femur which is actually interacting with the ilium and is creating this joint. More muscle stuff to come in a second. Now the other point I'd make is that the actual socket part of this ball and socket joint here part of the ilium has a name as well and it's called the acetabulum okay so let me write this in over here the acetabulum now some of your teachers might be saying to you well that's kind of a little bit high level for us or whatever this is a term that in my opinion a level students should be using let me be crystal clear it's not difficult you can do it and you should be incorporating it into your exams all of the exam boards will accept that as an appropriate answer to a question about articulating bones at the hip okay so it's important that you do have a knowledge of it you've already got ilium there you can use that of course but try and use it acetabulum if you can just the only thing i'd notice there is although it's not depicted brilliantly in this image it's actually quite a deep socket okay so the hip is quite a stable joint it's kind of useful for you to know now <clears throat> a couple of other features we also call this bit here this bit here which i'm kind of shading in here this bit here is what we call the femoral neck you can you can use that term if you want to the femoral neck okay the femoral neck is in there and you can you can use that term if you want to and my last point is to say on these points if we look at the coverage of the of the ball and the lining of the socket of course what we have in there is we have cartilage okay and that cartilage is used to shock absorb and protect and reduce the friction at that joint now where i'd like to go with this i'd like to get a good understanding of what muscles actually create movement here so i'm going to kind of list them really for you and i'm hoping that you can picture them in your mind so the first thing for me is i want to look at the notion of hip flexion okay so i'm going to take the notion of hip flexion now let me be clear Hip flexion is when you lift the leg from the hip and it moves in front of the body, okay? In front of the body through the sagittal plane. And that, of course, is like a kicking action at the hip or kicking forward uh, with, the, with the hip. And that is produced, but at, well, I mean, actually, it's actually produced by two muscles. I'll, I'll give you them both. One is called the iliacus, the iliacus, and the other one is called the psoas. And what these do, if we if we add these together, if we add these two muscles together to produce um, uh, a, 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 the muscle group, it gives us 
the iliopsoas muscle. Okay, so you're probably going to use this iliopsoas muscle here, but just know that that's made up of two muscles, the iliacus and the psoas. It's kind of, in my opinion, it's worth knowing. Secondly, I want you to also understand that if we are looking at extension of the hip, extension, we're going to do some questions on this in a, in a moment, extension of the hip is produced predominantly by the gluteus maximus so that big butt muscle on the back of our kind of upper leg you know that surrounds our bum you know that gluteus maximus is the muscle which draws the leg back as if you're going to kick behind you in an arabesque or some kind of donkey kick fashion that that the muscle that is the agonist to produce that is that gluteus maximus muscle so please 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 ensure that you can differentiate between the role of those different muscles with regard to flexion and extension now i also want to quickly talk about two other and possibly a third other type of movement so the first one i'd like to talk about is what we would call adduction okay and uh, let me change colors here let's go for this let's call it adduction okay so adduction is when a person brings the hip um, this is along the frontal plane, brings the hip from an abducted position back to the midline of the body. So let's call this back to the midline of the body as if you're bringing your legs in from a star jump. And we want to know that that adduction, I mean, there's, a, there's actually a few muscles that contribute to this, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you one that's kind of nice for you to use. We can refer there to your adductor longus, okay? And there's, there's a few other adductor muscles, but that's gonna get us home in terms of where we need to be. Now, abduction, which of course is the opposite of this, if we now look at abduction, let me do a different color to that one. If we look at abduction, abduction, which of course is taking the hip away from the midline of the body as if we're going into a star kind of position or we're, we're in the shape of something like a cartwheel with all limbs spread to make a star shape. That abduction is caused by a couple of muscles, actually a combination of muscles. So I'd like you to be able to refer to the gluteus, glute, sorry, the gluteus medius, and also the gluteus, the gluteus minimus. And those muscles contract to cause abduction. Now, the only other thing I'm going to say here, it very rarely comes up, is just be aware that the hip is also capable of rotation. Okay, and when I say rotation, you know, the, the internal rotating of the femur around its longitudinal axis. Now, I'm not going to take that any further, but just be aware that we can achieve rotation at the hip also, but we tend not to talk about it too much within uh, these within these sessions, okay? So they're the muscles there that I think you guys really need to grasp. And of course, what we've got here is that as a result of that, you know, if we're talking about abduction, this hip can move out in this, let me choose a color that's gonna work here, let's go for green. This hip can move out into this direction. In terms of adduction, it can move back into this direction. When we're talking about flexion extension, the hip is moving back that way for extension and in front of us for flexion. So let's get that clear in our minds, okay? Before we do some question demonstration, I also wanna have a look at the ankle. I need to shuffle my notes probably terribly loudly uh, in the background. That ah, wasn't too bad uh, until I dropped this bit paper on the floor, there you go. Um, so I wanna talk here a little bit about the ankle. Now, first thing I wanna say about the ankle, and it's sometimes something I've found that students get a little bit confused about, is that the, the ankle is a hinge joint, okay? So get that really clear. The ankle, like the knee, like the elbow, is a hinge joint. So we know the ball and socket is at the hip and the shoulder, for example. We know this hinge at the knee and uh, what am I forgetting? Elbow, but the ankle too is a hinge joint. Now, where it's slightly different with this hinge joint is that yes, it can move slightly through the movements of inversion and eversion, but we don't study that. So we're gonna sort of breeze over that sort of notion. Uh, brief, brief <coughs> excuse me, over that notion here. Now, what I'd like to kind of get clear with you guys, and we've kind of only partially uh, got this in the shot here, is that we've actually, um, we've, we, the bones we really want to have an awareness of is that we want to have an awareness of the tibia, okay, which is the shin bone. It's this big bone here that we can see running down this way. We also want to have an awareness of the fibula, which is often called the ankle bone. It's actually on this side. It's a smaller bone that sits alongside the tibia. And the other bone I'd like you to have an awareness of is the talus. Now the talus is this bone here, okay? So the talus is this bone here. So we see these are the articulating bones. But where it gets really interesting for me is when, when bear in mind this is not an articulating bone, but it's when we start looking at the role of the calcaneus, for example. Now the calcaneus 
is this bone here. Uh, someone told me recently, should we said calca uh, calcaneus, how was it? Calcaneus, sorry. So you use whichever pronunciation you like. So here's our calcaneus or calcaneus here. And of course, what we're finding in this particular, in, in, with this particular bone is it's attached, it's attached to this muscle here via this tendon. And I guess you guys all know that this is the Achilles tendon. The color doesn't really work on that, let's change it. You guys all know that that is the Achilles tendon, right? So the muscle we want to have an awareness of at the back here is the gastrocnemius muscle. That is the gastrocnemius muscle. And I also want you guys to know that there's another muscle which kind of sits at the back of our calf, and that is what we call a soleus. The soleus muscle, the soleus muscle. So it's a slightly shorter, fatter muscle that also produces the same movement. Now, the movement that these two muscles produce, let's do it like this, the movement that these two muscles produce is what we call plantar flexion. And let me show you a little bit of what that looks like. If I just drag back up to Josh a second, you can see here, this foot is kind of toes pointed there right toes pointed downwards as it, downwards like as if it was pointing down but underneath okay and that is what we call plantar flexion okay plantar flexion let me get this right plantar flexion and that's produced by the gastrocnemius and the soleus now this one here the front foot has got like the toes pulled up and that's achieved by a different muscle and that other muscle is what we call the tibialis, the tibialis anterior. And I've often found that students get a little bit confused by this muscle. Let me be clear, tibialis means it runs along the tibia and anterior means front, so it's on the front of the tibia. So we have a muscle which runs down here. It actually, it actually inserts, it inserts on the big toe, okay? So it inserts on the big toe. I'm not gonna get into technical names of, um, uh, of the toes here but we're just going to say it inserts onto the big toe and what that does is when that muscle contracts it brings the foot upwards and of course that's what we refer to as dorsiflexion now i've spent many years trying to figure out whether plantar flexion and dorsiflexion are one word or two and the conclusion i've come to is plantar flexion is two words here look one, two, and dorsiflexion is one word. Okay, so that's the format that I use. Someone might tell you differently, but that's the form I use. So we're interested that dorsiflexion pulls the toes upwards, plantar flexion pulls the toes, in fact, the calcaneus downwards. All right, nice. Let's do some questions. Let's have a look at this. So the way we're going to do these questions is that, you know, if you sit and watch me write these things in, you're going to get triple bored with me just sort of you know, stuttering over my poor handwriting. Okay, so we're going to do this slightly different. Instead, what I've done is I've prepared the answers in advance for you. And what we're going to do together is mark the number. Of course, you guys are able to submit your answers all being well uh, as a result of these sessions on these exact questions. Okay, but what I'd like to do is I'd like to go over this with you. So we've got a question here. The question is as follows. When sprinting, Josh's ankle moves through only one plane. Now I mentioned earlier, do you remember that that plane was the sagittal plane? All flexion extension moved through the sagittal plane. Explain, there's our command, explain how two different muscles combine to control the foot strike and the drive phase of the ankle. Okay, so we're looking at two different features of the ankle, basically what I just showed you above. Now, the, the, the thing that jumps out to me as the reader of that question is, okay, there's the knowledge there that I need to have, but it's the word explain, and I can't, let me just change color. It's the word explain. If you don't know what that means, you're gonna have a hard time with this question because it's asking for that specific skill. Now, explain means saying, how, why, or what something is or happens. Okay, so it's how, why, or what. And in this case, we're being asked for explain how. So I'm gonna try and use in my answers language that develops that. So I'm gonna use words like, I'm gonna use words like by. I'm gonna use words like through. I'm gonna use words like because or causing. I'm gonna use words like therefore, comma. Okay, and that way, I am making sure that I'm explaining. Now, if you wanna know more about that, for goodness sake, use our roadmap model. It teaches you exactly these things that will help. Let's mark this answer. The ankle moves through, moves through the sagittal plane. So look, that's gonna get us a mark. Circle tick, one mark, okay? So we've recognized the sagittal plane. The gastrocnemius controls the drive phase 
Okay, so we've we've talked about the gastrocnemius. We're going to get a mark for that, and it's in it's in re relation to controlling the drying phase. And look what I've got here by contracting and causing plantar flexion. Okay, so we're going to get a mark there. The tibialis anterior, thank you, controls the foot strike by causing dorsi flexion. Remember, by again, look by again there. By, I'm saying, but it's done by the following process. For both phases, the antagonist relaxes to allow the movement to occur. Now, I've already got max, and we could get an extra mark, I suppose, if there was one available for talking about how the antagonist operates in this sense, more of which in another session. Now, second question I've got here, and it depends which board you're on. If you're at Excel, you need to do that one. Everyone else, you need to do this one. Choose the question which is suitable for your exam board. Fine, we're going to focus on this one. Using a sporting example, describe. Now, for me, describing is um, giving the main details of something. Okay, so describing is things like characteristics. So we'd say things like characterized by, composed of, composed of. We might say what something is like. We might say what something is not. We might say what something is. These are all descriptive type language, uh, language or connective. So if we are describing something, we need to be showing that kind of language in our answer. So hip movement. So let me get this right. Using a sporting example, describe the movements of the hip through the sagittal plane. So hip movement in the sagittal plane, I almost wasted a bit of space there, is characterized by, look, there's my description, flexion and extension. I'm giving my answers. Hip flexion when sprinting is caused by the iliopsoas. An extension is caused by the gluteus maximus. Okay, so I'm going to get my max there again, and I could have got an extra mark. I think there's only three available to me if I, you know, if I'd needed that fourth one. So what have I done? That I guess I've always given one extra point over and above that, which is the the maximum mark, just to make sure. So look, a couple of things for me to draw out before we finish this little mini section. One is you must know your movement analysis. You must know your muscles, and you must know how your joints articulate. Two. The most important thing, in my opinion, when you come to do an exam answer, other than knowing your stuff, I mean, there's no substitute for that, let's be honest, but other than knowing your stuff, for goodness sake, you have to know the difference between what it means to describe and what it means to explain. And if, you, if you're not sure about evaluation, uh, evaluating, analyzing, uh, comparing, we're gonna cover a lot of this, by the way, uh, uh, justifying and so on and so on, you've gotta look at our model for the roadmap. I can't urge that enough. Anyway, I'm going to uh, pause this session here and we'll go back briefly into the uh, into the studio. When we come back, by the way, onto this part, we're going to be looking at muscular contraction straight back. Okay, so let's focus in on muscular contraction. And for those of you that study it, I'm not beginning to get into uh, Twi uh, twitch and summation and I'm not going to be getting into uh, sliding filament theory those things only appear on some of these courses so therefore I'm going to be leaving that for the purposes of the of the everlearner.com we have it all covered go there use the resources free trial blah blah go and get involved and you can study that stuff there what we're going to talk about here is types of contraction okay types of contraction so for me, I kind of decided to feature all of this around a single image. And I know someone's going to give me a hard time because they're going to say, that's not your athlete profile, James. And you're right. I'm making a bit of an exception here. We looked at Josh in the earlier session. And here we're looking at effectively a movement which is kind of useful for us because it involves all different kinds of uh, muscular contractions. So the first thing I want to do is I want to differentiate between two types of contraction. So I want to refer to an isotonic contraction and I want to refer to an isometric contraction. And again, some of you may want to go further and look at actions as a four, as a third grouping. Okay, and that's fine. I'm not going to touch on it here, but just know that it's there if you're interested. Now, isotonic effectively means effectively means with movement. Okay, so it's contraction of the muscle with some kind of movement, whereas isometric. It is with stillness, and I'll come back to this. We're not going to get into sort of principle of moments and the mechanical principles of this, but isometric or equal length means a stillness contraction. So let me explain. So let's assume, for example, let's assume, for example, that this knee joint here of this performer is going to remain stable for this entire period. This joint here is going to remain at whatever degrees this angle is. It's about 90 degrees, 85, something like that. So that's going to remain stable. So this is being controlled by isometric contractions. Now I'm hoping you will be able to recognize that there are 
two, at least two isometric contractions achieving that, okay? So one of them would be of the hamstring group here, okay? And one of them would be of the quadricep group. Now, yes, you guys may well want to use the terms for the hamstring, semimembranosa, semitendinosus, and biceps femoris. And for the uh, quadriceps, make sure I remember them all, the vastus, intermedius, lateralis, and medialis, and the rectus femoris. You should be able to name those things, so prepare to be able to do so, again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go and use our resources on theeverlearner.com and you will. Next, so we've got this notion. Now, you notice there, one thing I'd say, let me just repeat what I said a moment ago, where we've got an isometric contraction, we've got at least, we've always got at least two muscles that are performing that are performing that isometric contraction by definition we know that muscles work in pairs so if one muscle is working isometrically then its pair needs to work isometrically as well to keep that balance you know good examples would be a true like a moment of a, a skier skiing downhill uh, alpine skiing and being in, a, in that tuck position and holding that position steady we'd have numerous muscles contracting isometrically at that time now isotonic is a slightly different case it splits into two groups we have what we call our concentric contractions more of which in a second and we have what we call our eccentric contractions not to be confused with eccentric forces which are kind of which is which is how we describe a torque a force applied away from the center of mass of an object causing angular motion let's not get confused it's the same word different concept so let's look at these concentric and, and eccentric notions so we know isometric is stillness let me also actually add in there we've got same length that's literally what iso equal metric length means the muscle at least two at a time remains the same length and of course in here we tend to find that we're talking about some kind of balance and we're often talking about some kind of ready position okay ready position so you know in that case i was talking about the female performer there she's in the ready position in the sense that she's ready to receive the, the ball back so let's focus on her this guy in my opinion this guy is doing some well dodgy technique so i'm not going to focus on him because for some reason he seems to be receiving the ball with bent elbows which is not helpful to me so what i want to talk about here is i want to talk about this performer and i want to talk about her tricep brachii let me write it up here for you her tricep brachii remember there's a double i on the end it took me years to realize that how embarrassing um so we've got this tricep brachii the s on the end of tricep as well of course tricep brachii and it's this muscle at the back of the upper arm and the tricep brachii when it contracts typically what it's going to do is it's going to create elbow extension okay so we can make an argument that for this performer to have moved her elbows into that position elbow extension those tricep brachii have contracted how they've contracted concentrically for her to throw the medicine ball to or at who knows her partner okay so to or at her partner now of course this ball is going to make its way back to her okay now this is going to be a different situation so the ball is going to arrive to her hands here let me choose a approximately a blue color the ball is going to arrive to her hands here and of course what are we going to find that the elbows do well they're going to undertake flexion but they're not they're not performing flexion like they're pulling the ball in they're performing flexion in the sense that they're slowing the ball down okay and that's where these tricep brachii muscles they're going to actually lengthen during this flexion and they're gonna be working at the same time. So let me be clear about this. When we talk about concentric contractions, we are talking about shortening under tension, shortening under tension. Let me make sure we get all of our key language in, shortening under tension. We are talking about here, um, we're talking about here decreasing, decreasing joint angle. Okay, decreasing joint angle, and we're talking here about force generation. Okay, force generation. So when a muscle works concentrically, it shortens under tension, generates force, and it decreases the joint angle. Okay, decrease. And by the way, for this one, we're talking about the joint angle here. By the way, not here. Okay, joint angle there. So the eccentric contractions are a little different. They lengthen, lengthen under tension lengthen under tension they also increase increase joint angle and 
they do the following they act as a brake act as a brake as in braking a car or braking a bicycle or something like that okay so they're acting as a brake so this muscle as the ball arrives and the elbows flex, the tricep brachii are going to act eccentrically to slow the flight of that ball down, basically in order so it doesn't hit her in the chest, really. So it's going to slow it down gradually, and the tricep brachii is going to do that work while lengthening. And of course, we could also talk about things like the, the stomach muscles. The rectus abdominis, for example, is effectively going to do the same thing. As she's kind of pushed backwards with the weight and the power of the ball, that muscle is going to lengthen and work under tension to break, to slow that down. There'd also be other muscles like the hip flexors as well would do the same thing, but we're not going to get into that kind of detail. So what I'm interested in then is that we've got three types of contractions, concentric, eccentric, sorry, isotonic, concentric, isotonic, eccentric and isometric those three types of contraction can really go a long way to explaining a vast majority of muscular contraction types that the human body is capable of really all of them and i mentioned before we've got this notion of isokineticness but that's for another day so we've got those three now let's have a look at what we want to do with this practice questions so again same principle as before i've hidden my answer which i will reveal da -da 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 -da. how exciting so i've revealed my answer here and we've got a question. Laura does a handspring. There she is. And Laura, by the way, is one of our one of our athletes, very good gymnast, both artistic and rhythmic. Compare is our command word. Let's make a note of that. Compare is our command word. Compare the types of contractions performed by Laura's quadricep. We know that's the front of her thigh muscle group during takeoff and landing now it's using the word quadriceps so we can use in our answer if it talks about rectus femoris we would specifically use that word as one of the quadriceps but where i want to focus first is on this compare so what does comparing mean well it means that we have to compare one thing to another so by definition we have to use things like the following language comma space whereas however with a capital comma in contrast, comma, similarly, because when you compare things, they can be the same, of course, similarly, comma, this is the type of language we'd expect to use in a comparison or a comparing response. And I can't emphasize enough to you that if you're not using that type of language in your answers, you are not comparing in your answers. You might be describing two different things. Now, if I was the examiner, you might think I'm a harsh get here for this but if i ask you to compare in a question and you don't compare i'm not going to give you any marks now i'm not saying that's what your exam board's going to do often they don't do that because they can be a bit woolly sometimes but i'm saying to you if you're asked to compare you should show a comparison in your answer now i've also said here look i've made i've made a if you like a deliberate a deliberate mistake in my answer criticize this answer please okay so we've got a four mark question we've got to compare the quadriceps landing and takeoff let's see what we get during takeoff the quad see if you get the criticism before i finish during the takeoff the quadriceps can contract concentrically so there's the concentrically comma space whereas during landing they work eccentrically circle tick or sunglasses tick one mark at takeoff the muscles shorten under tension in contrast comma look contrast comma they lengthen on landing sunglasses tick one mark have you got the criticism yet at takeoff they generate force concentrically of course upwards however comma look there's my however comma at landing they reduce downwards momentum by acting as a brake sunglasses tick one mark what do you notice is the criticism i only made three comparisons do you see what i've done the answer there the skill I'm being asked for is to compare. So if I don't compare for four marks, what am I doing for four marks? Now, I still think that answer in, I'm probably being super harsh, right? I, I sort of feel like that's my job at this point before your exams to get you ready. Um, would you potentially get four marks for that answer? Maybe you might do. Um, but the, I'm trying to drill that home that you, you've, if you're asked to compare, if you're asked to describe, if you're asked, 
asked to explain, you must do it. And again, I can't emphasize strongly enough, if you want to learn that better, you have to use our roadmap model, which is wonderful for that. Okay, next question. Justify is our command, okay? Justify the need for the tricep brachii, just looked at it, to perform both concentric and eccentric muscle contractions during a complete press-up. So for me, a complete press-up is down and up. So I'm going to look at the whole thing. And I've got to justify. So justify statements are things like, the reason for this, we might find, and you know, the reason for this, one possibility, one possibility, another reason, you might even in this put, in my opinion, in my opinion, okay, that is getting towards a conclusion type statement, but you might put that sort of thing, in my opinion, comma, so here, let's have a look. The reason for this, you know, I just said that one, is that during the up phase, the tricep brachii shortens under tension in the up phase, circle tick, one mark. And in the down phase, they lengthen under tension, circle tick, one mark. Another reason is that the tricep brachii must act as a break on the way down. Now, notice in this one, you know, I haven't even used the words concentric and eccentric. Why? Why would I not use the words concentric and eccentric? I mean, there's nothing wrong with using them here, but I didn't use them. Why? And the reason for that is I knew they weren't going to get many marks because they were already in the question. So, okay, I might use them in my answer, but ultimately I'm justifying and that's what's going to get me the marks. There's nothing for me rewriting the words in the question. Okay, there's nothing for me doing that. So I have to be able to justify why they're like that or why it happens like that in order for me to get the marks so i guess what my duty is here to you guys as you prepare for this stuff is i really want to get you razor sharp thinking about the nature of these questions get you sort of really well armed to be able to look at a question and go yeah i know what that's asking me to do yeah you know so it's your job to get the content ready and i'm i guess i'm helping you a little bit with that but I suppose it's my job and the teachers around you likewise to say to you, this is what it means to describe. This is what it means to explain. And I think all of us out there, if we're in a classroom today and we're, we're the adult, we're the teacher, we have to be able to say what that is, right? We have to be able to say, right, young people, to evaluate means exactly this. Yes, I know that the exam boards can give us a bit of grief on that one because they can confuse things a little bit. But... If we can't do it, they're not going to be able to do it either. So we have to be able to get that right. So we really want to be able to give you a nice, concise, clear picture of what that is. I am rambling and banging on, so I will close this bit here. Okay, so we are ready to go. Go. let's do some stuff on cardiac health let me say probably cardiac health so first point i really want to get to here is i want to immediately talk to you about the notion of atherosclerosis atherosclerosis james you hit us with the big word straight away yes indeed i do but it's a nice simple concept and it has kind of a broad application so it's a nice one for us to learn now i don't know why <clears throat> exactly perhaps it's my shock in teaching but Many students I've worked with in the past have found this kind of like a testing, tricky thing to grasp hold of. So let's see if we can sim simplify it. The main point I want to get across to you is that atherosclerosis is caused, not surprisingly, by atheroma. And atheroma are probably best described as types of plaque which build up in the blood vessel. I'm going to actually demonstrate this to you in a few moments in a few moments time and particularly they are caused by what we call ldl cholesterol low density lipoprotein cholesterol okay so this is things like saturated fats animal products animal fats if we're consuming for example a lot of red meat uh, over an extended period of time it may well cause this atheroma and i want to sort of emphasize to you now kind of pictorially what that would look at look like and we've got here sort of just two depictions of uh, two different arteries one which is kind of vasoconstricted this one let me choose a different color this one which is vasoconstricted and this one is vasodilated a little bit you see the smooth muscle is a little less kind of robust on the on this right hand side but that's not the important thing at this particular time what is important however is the following when we build up something like an atheroma, we start to get a kind of a, a build-up of plaque and fatty tissue in the lumen. Notice this word lumen. Lumen simply means the space within the artery. And of course, as this plaque develops, over time, we're talking about significant periods of time here, as this kind of plaque develops, what we're going to 
experience here is that ultimately, as this plaque develops in here, ultimately what we're going to come up with is we're going to end up with a situation where we have what we would loosely describe as a narrow lumen. And trust me, you do not want a narrow lumen in this situation. So it's, it's really not good. And the reason that is negative is because we experience an increase in resistance. And if we incre if we experience an increase in resistance to, to, to blood flow, of course, what that's going to cause is an increase to blood pressure. It's going to lead to conditions such as hypertension, more of which in, in a few moments' time. Now, something else, and I'm going to sort of come back to this in a moment, something else which is kind of nasty here. I'll kind of depict it over on this one. Let me just sort of draw in a big kind of atheroma over here. Right, one of the things that happens with atheroma is they have a really negative impact on the wall of the artery itself. So what we find is that this section of the artery, like this section here, could actually completely what we describe as calcify. So this part of the artery over time could become rigid and kind of like, I almost like want to call it like a bit of rock, you know, like solid, non-elastic. And as a result of that, this entire, this entire kind of artery has less capacity to flex, to be adaptable to different blood pressures. And as a result of that, of course, then um, we're going to experience sort of pain and we're going to experience potentially certain other coronary heart disease impacts. So that is also a really important point. I'll come back to that in a second in terms of the elasticity. But I wanted you to kind of grasp it that this section would also kind of calcify. Let me change colour. They would also calcify. And that calcification is really negative bad business we don't want that okay so i'll get back to my atheroma for a second what causes it particularly ldl cholesterol but also sedentary lifestyle remember that a sedentary lifestyle is a lifestyle where we spend too much time sitting and lying down and over an extended period of time when as adults we are not getting our five times 30 minutes of activity per week okay so that's what we mean by that we've said already we get an increase in resistance and of course this can lead can lead more of which in a second to chd coronary heart disease and of course if this gets significant enough if this gets significant enough we are going to lead to kind of like a blockage type situation and what often happens with blockages is that the the atheroma starts higher up the artery and then it kind of slips down into smaller arterioles and blocks the entire thing so of course that's going to be a really really dangerous thing to happen to somebody um and look, the only other thing I was going to say about it, I've, tr I've mixed my colours up, but it can be improved, okay? So it can be improved how? So a couple of things, exercise, all right? Well, you, you kind of guess you knew I was going to say that, right? And we also like the fact that things like HDL cholesterol, and this is still incorporating things like fats, but we're talking about having taking fats from a plant-based diet, things like olive oils, vegetable oils, this kind of thing, can actually help to reduce these atheroma. Okay, so that can be really useful as well. Right, a couple of other points, because I've already spent too long on it. And by the way, let me just make a point here. Imagine, imagine say, the atheroma was building up here in this vessel here, Okay, and then it kind of like got squeezed down and ended up somewhere like here. Okay, you can see the kind of damage that would do. And this is why people often need to have things like bypass surgery because of these types of slips and blockage. I'll talk about angina and heart attack in a second. But I also want to talk to you about what I, I would describe as arteriosclerosis. Arteriosclerosis. Now, these concepts are very often mixed up. That's an R there, believe it or not, arteriosclerosis. So the first thing I'd want you to know about arteriosclerosis is it includes atherosclerosis. Now, you think this is confusing already, right? Well, at least you don't need to know about arteriolosclerosis, for example. <laughs> that, trust me, that is a thing. Atherosclerosis. Have I spelled that right? Okay, so this up here... This up here is an example of arteriosclerosis. But the point I really want to make here is what I said before. We are talking about inelastic, inelasticity. Inelasticity. And we're talking about, as I said before, calcification. Calcification of what? The arterial wall. So, of course, we're talking about this hardening. Hardening. Hardening of arterial wall. Okay, so I've already made that point to you, but now we can summarize it with good quality language. And why is this negative? Because it will really restrict restrict flow 
to organs. Okay, so this is a nasty condition and it's something that can develop in a lot of people over time. And it's something, you know, I've, I've given you the example here where this atheroma develops up here and effectively like slips down and ends up here. And that's where blockages get caused. Now, the one thing I would say about that is that when the when the blockage or the, the atheroma is up here, we often get pain in the chest and we call that angina. Okay, but when it slips down here, this is where we tend to get things like um, heart attack. Okay, so this becomes a more serious, it's already a serious condition, but it becomes more serious. Now, a couple of points before we get on to some questions. I want to mention a bit more about sedentary lifestyles. Sedentary lifestyles, you've already said it's too much sitting and lying down. Think about the, the, the classic example of someone as an adult, you know, driving to work, going straight from being in bed to getting up, eating, you know, some bacon and eggs, getting in their car, driving to within 50 meters of their office chair, sitting in their office chair all day, getting home and then sitting in the sofa. You know, you, you, you get the idea that over a period of time that can be negative. So what, why, what do we want to say about that? It increased the risk of CHD. We've mentioned coronary heart disease already. Um, as we've said already, it can cause arteriosclerosis. So being active is a really positive thing. That's what we were trying to say. And of course, arteriosclerosis can reduce our capacity for things such as vascular shunt. Okay, so our, re our capacity to redistribute cardiac output as required becomes less and less. And of course, the, we're saying about um, arteries here, they become inelastic and less flexible in that sense. And we know already that an example of this is what we would call atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis, <laughs> twice I've nearly struggled to spell that. So again, think about the word atheroma in your answers, please. It would really improve your answers to improve that, it, it, to, to include that. Now, I also want to talk to you about the notion of a stroke. Now, I'm not going to go into details about the two different types of stroke here. We're going to generalize. But of course, with a stroke, what we're talking about here, we're talking about a blockage. Okay, so this is a blockage of a blood vessel to the brain in one format. I know you guys, some of you studied a bit more in depth and you know the other format as well, but I'm not going to touch that today. So the blockage to the brain, and that, of course, is going to rob the brain of the oxygen it needs to function. And people can become very, very poorly in that situation. And you may know the certain characteristics of sort of lopsidedness in someone who's experienced a stroke. I've had some very close people to me recently uh, experiencing it. It's a reasonably, well, it's a very, very unpleasant thing. They're, they're all fine, thankfully. Now, I also wanted to talk to you about heart attack. Now, I've already sort of given you the circumstances for a heart attack, or at least the one where we have an atheroma blockage. But I also want to give you another name for heart attack. I'd like you, if you can, to call it a myocardial infarction and I may ask Marta in a moment about the word infarction I think she might have something interesting to tell us about it as a Catalan Spanish speaker she might be able to tell us a bit about that word so um, finally on this one I've mentioned angina this is pains across the chest because uh, the upper blood vessels to the heart are becoming blocked and of course we have the chronic high blood pressure we call hypertension so this is chronic long-term high blood pressure characterized characterized by something like 140 over 90 for our blood pressure and of course let's put our let's put our uh, units in MMHG. So 140 over 90 is going to be characteristic of this hypertension, chronic high blood pressure, and that's going to be caused by a sedentary lifestyle. So you guys, you, you, I think you're great examples of it. You guys are active, you take part in regular activity, and these are the reasons why. Now, let me just put the question up first of all. Questions. Summarize. Interesting command, this one. Summarize. It ultimately means describe. Summarize the likely impacts of Tom's return to regular physical activity on his cardiovascular system as I rush on my paper in the background. As I rustle, get the right bit of paper, James. So let's have a look at this. So we're looking at the impacts of Tom's return to regular physical activity, so now not a sedentary lifestyle, on his cardiovascular health. So we're only interested in cardiovascular health. So let's have a look. Tom's lifestyle is now non-sedentary. What does that mean? It means it's active. We'd probably get a mark for that. Regular exercise, and look, I've put five times 30 minutes a week. Would it get me a mark? Who knows? But I know it, so it's going in my answer. Is preventative of atherosclerosis. Okay, so my circle tick, one mark over there. Hypertension as well. I'll probably get another mark for that. Chronic high blood pressure as well as coronary heart disease. Now, I'm not going to give myself a CHD. It's kind of a generic term. I might get the mark, but let's go on. Specifically, regular activity will prevent atheroma. 
Now, interesting one. Will atheroma and atherosclerosis get us two different marks or one? We, we can only consider that. But my point about my answer here is I probably should have gone for something else, right? Because I've kind of made it. Maybe I need to explain a bit more, describe a bit more. But this is interesting, which causes a narrowing of the lumen. Now I get my mark. Okay, because I've gone further with my answer. And then associated increase in resistance. Okay, and that's resistance obviously to cardiac output. And now I've got my max and I'm in good shape. I've also got finally Tom is less likely to experience stroke or myocardial infarction. So I could potentially pick up marks there if I hadn't got the max already. Next question, explain. Now, something about explain before we look at this, and you can probably pick this up as we go. When we're saying explain why, we are going to be expecting our answer things like because therefore with a capital and a comma after it therefore comma we're going to expe expect things like this means if we're explaining why we're going to expect this type of structure let's see if we get it in fact let's go through that first there's my because there's my because there's my therefore comma there's my this means so i'm clearly explaining now let's have a look whether i got a decent answer or not so why might be experienced high blood pressure? This might be because he has lived a sedentary lifestyle. There's my term again. And because he has consumed too much LDL cholesterol. Nice. Therefore, comma, he may be experiencing plaque buildup. Nice. There's my mark. In fact, I've got my max, but my answer goes a little further. Or atherosclerosis. This means that hypertension, you know, I'm giving that a name. I might get my an extra mark there potentially, becomes more likely. So, Two fairly simple questions, but I'm doing more than enough to get myself those marks. So we're going to go back and talk to you a bit about some Q&A and some other bits and bobs. Okay, so let's move on to this respiratory health stuff. And, and pretty much without doubt, the most significant aspect in kind of typical westernized human uh, behavior and health with regards to the respiratory system is the notion of smoking. Now, you could make an argument that pollution and inhalation of chemicals is up there, but this seems to be, and certainly traditionally in the last 100 years, has been something which has caused gigantic damage and something which you know we really have to address. So first things first, let me give you, a, I'm, by the way, I'm loosely talking about cigarettes, wider tobacco, I'm probably not experienced, probably not educated enough on all forms of smoking to tell you specifically, but I'm talking about industrially produced cigarettes when I talk about this, and I'm sure it extends a little beyond that too, but nevertheless, let, let me make sure I'm being clear about that. So I want to talk to you first of all about one of the effects of smoke. It causes a mucus buildup. Okay, a mucus buildup. And I'm going to talk about this a bit more detail in a second when I look at asthma. Um, and you'll get to look at actually see some mucus. Hmm. Um, the, the point about mucus is it builds up in the bronchioles. And as a result of that, or, or, or the reason it does that is it's attempting to block the smoke. So think about that for a second. The smoke that we are actively breathing in is... Our body, our system is trying to block it by producing mucus to mop up that kind of contaminant. Okay, so that's what's happening. But as a result of that, this kind of bronchial structure is building up with horrible kind of mucus and getting narrower and narrower within that bronchial. It's not a very good drawing, but you take sort of the nice simple point there. Other things I'd oh, let me let me add that point there. So we want to talk about narrowing bronchioles, narrowing bronchioles. Okay, you get the idea, this sort of notion of the lumen again that we talked about with um, the with, with the arteries and the atheroma, you would get that point again. Other points that are really super important for us to talk about with regard to um, with, uh, about uh, smoking is that it causes what we call contamination of alveoli. Contamination of alveoli, that's a long thing to write. Sorry if you have to wait for me. Contamination of alveoli. And what we mean by that is that um, um, structures like tar, even carbon monoxide, for example, what it can do is it can contaminate the alveoli, like make them filthy and dirty, basically, and it causes a disease called emphysema. And the important thing to realize about emphysema, this contaminated this disease of contaminated alveolar structures is it's permanent. So look, these delicately beautiful uh, alveolar structures over here, if they become contaminated with things like tar, it may well be completely permanent and irreversible. Now, let me be clear to be on the other fair side of this. This does happen after a period of time of smoking. And I speak in some of my videos about the notion of pack years or pack years. So it's especially dangerous is... Um, 
is uh, if you smoke beyond 10 pack years, so that's 10 years of smoking 20 cigarettes a day, beyond that point, this becomes extremely possible that this is going to happen to you, even likely in many, many cases. So other things, we have little cleaning structures in our lungs called cilia. They're like little hair-like structures. You know, think of them a bit like nasal hairs, but microscopic. They die, and those, obviously, they're, they're preventing um, contamination by smoke, and they die off. And that, that makes it even filthier. We also get, as a result, things like lung infections. Okay, so this can be numerous kinds, but can be really, really nasty. Um, equally, we can also talk about sort of the tendency for a long-term cough and particularly about the notion of bronchitis. Okay, so these are some, you know, serious horrid conditions that can be caused by smoking. I, I don't want to just give you a, a horror story here, um, but it kind of is the reality. We're also talking about tar in the lungs. I've also already mentioned this. Tar is literally that, a black stuff that you could potentially put on the roads. Um, so you don't really want it in your lungs. It kind of goes without saying, but that the smoking produces that. So, it, you know, it, it can very much blacken this internal environment of the lung over here. Not very scientific drawing, let's be honest, James. Never mind. But more importantly, not more importantly, but equally, um, smoking also causes lung cancer and don't just think it's um, limited to lung cancer as well it can also cause things like throat cancer and there have been actually some really high profile cases of even it causing mouth cancer and um, mouth cancer comes with removal of the tongue for example for many people so um, yeah I don't know let's, let's not get too somber within this area but we're talking about a serious thing I think that's one, what we're trying to say but what I do want to lead on to is that smoking is also related to a an experience called COPD or COPDA. They didn't work very hard on this particular um, acronym. So let's have a look at COPDA. As we see here, it is this, it is called the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So anything, remember pulmon is the Latin for lung. So anything which is a long-term obstructive lung disease. Now, of course, what we've just talked about with smoking is a classic example of exactly that. A classic example of exactly that. But we have also got other uh, diseases and conditions as well. So I want to kind of really where I want to draw on this with you is I want to talk to you about the impact of COPD. So the first thing we need to realize is it can dramatically reduce endurance. So think about endurance as that kind of aerobic performance. Now you might not be thinking of someone who's got you know poorly lungs is likely to take part in sport and physical activity, but you know everyone should be right. So that's going to become far less likely. We can experience a decrease in lung capacity as a result of what I like to call copter, which for me sounds like some kind of delicious Turkish meat delicacy. It might just be uh, in my mind, I don't know. Um, we're also talking about a decreased surface area, decreased surface area of alveoli of alveoli so the alveoli the site of gaseous or gaseous exchange also is going to decrease its surface area as a result of this condition now i also want to talk about carbon monoxide or co carbon monoxide which i didn't talk about with uh, cigarette smoke but obviously i you know it's, it's a product um, which is breathed in through smoking and the important thing to realize about um, co or carbon monoxide is it blocks o2 it blocks o2 and it blocks co2 Okay. Now, specifically, it blocks these two molecular gases from binding onto hemoglobin. So the impact of that is a reduced partial pressure of oxygen. There's a two there, by the way. Partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. And, of course, a decrease in gaseous exchange, all of which is going to have negative lifestyle impacts. But, of course, if we look at this from the performance perspective, this is also going to have significantly negative performance um, impacts as well. Right. Finally, before we get into some questions, Questions here. I'm going to spend a little bit of time here talking about asthma. Asthma is a condition which is experienced by a very large number of people, including a great many, many young people. Okay, so let me just show you what we're looking at here. Okay, let me just show you what we're looking at here. So over here, this is what we might loosely call. So this one here is what we might loosely call healthy. 
Okay, so this one's loosely what we would call healthy. And by the way, we made these images. I must give a shout out to Mike, who's doing like the chat and the questions and things today. He made these on a um, on Adobe Illustrator. Some of you, I'm sure, have got experience with this. Some of you students out there, I think that's pretty spectacular for you know for us uh, supposedly not so bright P teachers to kind of make. Right, I think it's pretty cool. And we're not trained in this. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of proud. I want to give him a bit of a shout out for it. If you want a nice image making, get in touch with him. It's going to cost you, but you know what I mean. Get in touch with him. So. This is this is what we call a healthy, and I should have said here, bronchiole. Okay, bronchiole. So this is a, a healthy bronchiole. Oh, it's before an asthma attack. Might be another way of putting it. And what we find here is, of course, the main point I want to make here is that this area here, which we refer to as the lumen, is nice and wide. What am I drawing here? It's nice and wide. You get the idea. It's really nice and open, and you see comparatively what's happened over here. Other points I'd like to make are that in this sort of surrounding structure here, this blue kind of butterfly area, this is what we call smooth muscle. Smooth muscle. Okay, smooth muscle. And you will have come across smooth muscle before because it's a type of muscle which, for example, surrounds the uh, digestive tract. It also surrounds um, art arteries and veins as well as venules and arterioles. And this smooth muscle, of course, it can constrict and it can dilate. So it can tighten and it can loosen, more of which in a second. And this yellow structure here, so F here, is... Let me do that in a different colour. F here is... I don't think that's made any better, is mucus. So this yellow structure here is mucus. And you can see here, there's a bit of mucus there. It's mopping up things like contaminants. It's mopping up things like, I don't know, smoke, uh, pollution, hair, dust. It's mopping up those kind of things, and it's sticking to the side of the wall, and it eventually sort of brings it in as part of its mucus body, and then we get rid of it. We kind of can secrete it out. Now, that's all well and good, but we also have here these little fellas coming down here. These little fellas coming down. Um, and this is kind of what we would describe here as an allergen. An allergen. Okay, an allergen. And what's going to happen in this case is this allergen is going to be picked up by this little fella here. Oh, it's actually this one here. Look, it's being picked up by this. And this is what we call a detector cell a detector cell and what we find in asthmatics is when these detector cells when they actually pick up um when they actually pick up these these allergens and of course the allergen could be something like pollen it could be dog hair it could be dust something that provokes an asthmatic reaction what happens is that the asthmatic starts to produce within the smooth muscle starts to produce this red dotty thing over here and this red dotty thing is not a bad case of measles it is what we refer to as histamine and histamine it, it has numerous properties but the main property of histamine in this context what we want to know is that it causes the muscle to constrict it causes constriction of it causes constriction of that smooth muscle so that smooth muscle begins to constrict equally the other thing that happens is we start to produce an excrete mucus that excrete wasn't the right verb i wanted there we start to uh, produce and go into sort of overdrive of production of mucus so we get much more of this kind of yellow mucus substance which is now where we move over to example two where we've got either the middle or after an asthma attack and we see now we're in a situation where the smooth muscle has pulled in it's narrowed down the bronchiole to a very small uh, lumen and the mucus that's being produced is making that even smaller and this is why someone experiencing an asthma attack and it may well have happened to people i'm sure if you're in a classroom it would have happened to somebody in your classroom this is why this is a particularly unpleasant and nasty experience it usually sorts itself out and most people have good strategies to deal with it but nevertheless this is a deeply unpleasant thing to go through now a couple of other things i would like to say to you i want to talk to you about what we call a beta agonist a beta agonist and a beta agonist is what you guys might refer or you guys might think of as kind of like a let's see if I can do some dodgy drawing here as what you guys might think of as kind of like a 
I don't know if you can guess what it is yet. It's what you guys might think of as an inhaler. Okay, and this blue one is what we call the reliever. The reliever inhaler, and it's the beta agonist inhaler. And what this does is it re it actually uh, releases um, a, 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 a beta 2 um, agonist cell, and these kind of come down here into the bronchial and they're picked up by these little detector cells slightly different ones this time and these are what we call our beta detectors our beta detectors beta detectors and these beta detectors what they do is that they cause the smooth muscle to relax okay and if we can achieve that of course then the bronchial is going to open and this asthma attack is going to be to some degree at least avoided now a couple of things that i would say to you that are really important that you guys need to have an aware awareness of with regard to asthma okay so so first things first make sure that you know that uh, allergens are things like fumes they're things like smoke they're things like pollen all of these can trigger an asthma attack in somebody. There are things like animals, and you know, I'm not breathing one in, but it's hair, it's it's fur. There are things like dust, and there are things like chemicals. Now, if you think about the modern world, those things are in abundance. Okay, so that's that's why we're um, potentially seeing quite a, a predominant experience of of asthma. One might be able to argue. I, I must say, I, I haven't read a whole lot of research about that. So let me draw back on my conclusive statement. I'm giving you an impression, I suppose. Um, I would want to say to you as well that the I don't know why I didn't do this in blue, but the blue inhaler, the blue inhaler, is what we call is what we call a bronchodilator. A bronchodilator and don't forget that I haven't got a brown on here this is the nearest I've got to brown and that the brown the brown is what we'd call the preventer okay so it prevents situation one developing into situation two now finally on this before we do a couple of questions you have to avoid asthma or asthmatic attacks if you do experience asthma so you avoid it in the following ways these are some methodologies one caffeine perhaps not that useful for children but is an effective bronchodilator also when we're taking part in sport and physical activity we do a warm-up because we do have this kind of like exercise induced asthma so by building up that can help a great deal we can experience what we call imt inspiratory muscle training a little device that we can use that strengthens the diaphragm strengthens the intercostal strengthens the abdominals strengthens the what am i think pectoral stenocleidomastosclenes, mastosclenes all those peripheral breathing muscles we also find that oil especially fish oil it can be quite effective at warding off asthma and also a diet which is low in salt all of these methodologies can be quite effective at least helping or aiding preventing asthma now we've got some questions to do i have to just quickly change my canvas because it's on a second canvas i shall be straight back to you with that demonstration Okay, so we're back with Tom again, bless him. He must be, as you see here, we've got some questions with Tom. He must be thinking that we <laughs> we don't think much of his health, but never mind. Let's get on with this. So we've got a question here. Describe is our command. Describe means that we are going to do the following. We are going to give the characteristics. We are going to give the composition. Characteristics. We are going to give the composition. We're going to say what something is. We're going to say what something is like. We're going to say what something is not. Okay, we're going to give the details of something if we're describing it. We don't have to say the because is the therefore commas. We don't have to say the this means. We don't have to say the strengths, the weaknesses. We don't have to say the the whereas is similarly because we're not comparing. Okay, But what we have to do is we have to give characteristics and composition, what it's like, what it is, what it is not. So let's see a couple of examples. Let's see a little example of that. Let's have a little read of this question. Describe the negative impact of an unhealthy lifestyle on the respiratory system. So nice, simple question. Impacts of an unhealthy lifestyle on the respiratory system. So um, an unhealthy lifestyle is characterized how? It's characterized, remember I said it before, by a sedentary lifestyle. Circle, tick one mark. I'm looking for four. And choices such as smoking, possibly. I'm not going to give myself that one. Let's say that we've got negative lifestyle. COPD. I would probably write it out if I was doing an exam to be honest. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. 
becomes more likely and decreasing lung capacity, so this is happening, decreasing lung capacity and alveolar surface area, so that's also decreasing. Smoke is composed of tar, nicotine and carbon monoxide and this contaminates the alveoli, contaminates the alveoli, I've got my max, okay, and causes, look, there's another one, emphysema, finally, chronic bronchitis. So this type of language is going to get me my marks because I'm describing the impact of unhealthy lifestyle, specifically on what? The respiratory system. If I talked about smoking causing coronary heart disease, which, by the way, it does contribute to that classification we talked about earlier, also is impacted on by smoking, for example, I'm not going to get any marks here. Why? Because I'm asked about the respiratory system. So anything outside of that genre is not going to get me anywhere. You've got to stay in that paradigm, unless, of course, like some of you have to do, you OCR guys, for example, probably the best example, where sometimes you do have to make links between topics in some of your answers okay so just just be aware of that as well um now then let's move on to the next question this time making specific res reference to respiratory health so again they're only interested in respiratory health cardiac health here vascular health pointless because i'm not going to get any marks for it explain why there's my command explain why again i already know what sort of words i'm going to use i know i'm going to have becauses i know i'm going to have this means I actually don't remember if I've put these in this time. I know I'm going to have therefore, or therefore, comma. I'm also going to have things like um, as a result, or as a result of, spell it properly, James, and so on and so on. So these kind of terms are going to be my explain why. Explain why Tom should continue to exercise regularly and choose not to smoke. So this is about regular exercise and smoking. So let's have a little go at it. So Tom should not smoke because mucus, so there's, look, because we've already talked about it, right? Mucus builds up, there's one, boom, mark, blocking to, to block the smoke. That's why it's doing it. I'm actually saying why. This means, look, there's my connective again, bronchioles narrow, circle tick, boom, one mark I'm looking for four, causing bronchitis, probably getting one there as well. I like. Moreover, comma. Oh, James, spoiling us here. Moreover, comma. If you write moreover in your exam, that's how you're writing it. Moreover is one word and it has a comma after it at the start of a sentence. You lot got that, right? That's how you're writing it. Why? Well, apart from I'm shouting down a microphone, because it's good grammar. And you, you lot, you should be able to do that, okay? So get it right. That's my little lecture over. Nicotine is addictive. I didn't mention this earlier, actually. Nicotine is addictive. So that's, again, negative. Now, I'm not going to give myself that mark because I reckon everything I've said so far is about smoking. It's asking me about smoking and regular exercise. So maybe there's a submax in this question for maybe two or maybe you get a max of three for one of those or two. So exercise can increase lung capacity. Nice. There's my mark. I've actually got on my max there if I go with what I've done already. Uh, cleanse the bronchioles that could get me a mark and improve aerobic function so all of that could be really really nice for me to include in my answer but I've got my max and I've done enough don't forget that sub maxing I'm asked two things there I'm asked about smoking and I'm asked about exercising regularly if you're asked about two things within a question or you've got an A and a B that break the question up you must talk about both. if they break it up into A and B it's easier isn't it because they're telling you where to write each bit but if it's within one question you must address both parts of that question and say in this case explain why okay so nice answers uh let's go back into the camera view and i guess what we might call the studio from here forward okay we are ready let's make a a real let's make a good start on this one for me, this topic is a really important one for a couple of reasons. We might get what we might refer to, and we'll show you some of these in a moment, bespoke questions um, about this particular topic. But the other thing for me is that this content and this understanding, it filters through to a large amount of other understanding. A great example of that would be something like recovery processes or energy systems or VO2 max, for example. So we've got to realize that we are also preparing ourselves to answer in other topic areas when we get a fundamental grasp of these concepts. So I'm kind of aiming to do both things. What we're going to do is in terms of exam example answers is look at this kind of bespoke thing where we literally get asked about cardiovascular values but that knowledge can of course underpin a whole range of information and not and, and understanding in, in a range of other stuff all right first things first 
we have this uh, base equation here. And of course, we're looking uh, at our performer here, our triathlete. And what we're going to say here is that we have a situation where cardiac output, which I'd encourage you to remember that can be called Q dot cardiac output equals, I don't know if my yellow is going to work on here. Let, let's give it a go. SV stroke volume multiplied by heart rate. And I don't think anyone's going to be too shocked at that statement. Maybe this Q dot is going to be something that's new to you. Q is the symbol for uh, for cardiac output, and the dot means per minute, actually literally per unit of time, but in our context, per minute. So let's go through what each of these things. So here, of course, with heart rate, we are talking about heart contractions, heart contractions per minute. Okay, heart contractions per minute. That's our, you know, very simple sort of definition of the frequency of heart contractions. Our stroke volume, of course, we have got blood. I'm going to go for a very shorthand version of the. Doesn't that yellow look different? It's the same yellow on white and black. That's interesting. Blood ejected from. I'm going to just put LV left ventricle per contraction. Okay, so we've got a situation here where stroke volume, stroke volume which we know is the amount, the quantity of blood ejected from the left ventricle per contraction. If we multiply that by the, the number of times the heart beats per minute, we should already be able to define what cardiac output does. I'm almost tempted to pause for a moment and ask you to write your own definition in here because you should be able to define it from the basis of what I've just put on the screen with no other information if you'd never studied this before because we've got this equal sign. This side, this side, <laughs> this side has to be equal to this side. So to make that the case, of course, we're going to have here a quantity of blood leaving the left ventricle per minute. Per minute. And really where I want to go with this is just to put some numbers in, okay, just to make sure that we can understand that. Now, I've mentioned left ventricle a couple of times here. You know, you might find... Um, your ex your example accepts leaving the heart, but I think you should be saying uh, leaving the left ventricle. We are talking about about the blood passing through the systemic circuit, so specifically leaving that left ventricle via the aorta, the aortic arch, and then into the the network of arteries and arterioles leading to the capillaries. So that's why we want to be specific with that. Now, in terms of numbers, we find let's go for let's say uh, let's do this. So we're going to say at rest. Here. So this is going to be our resting value. We find that cardiac output um, tends to be in the region on average of five liters. Okay, so we've got five liters, and that's got to equal something. And of course, we've got blood ejected from the left ventricle per contraction, and we tend to find that this is in the region of about. Why did I? <laughs> why did I do a pound sign? Of about. 70 milliliters okay approximately 70 milliliters of blood leaves yours and my left ventricle per contraction as we sit doing the kind of things we do now i guess my heart's going a little bit harder and i've maybe got a bit more um sort of venous return coming back to my heart because i'm kind of a little bit tense doing this but nevertheless that's a, the approximate level and we're going to multiply that by a number to get five now you can calculate that exactly if you want i'm going to estimate it and we're going to say that our heart rate therefore is going to be in the region of 72 beats per minute. Now, before we get to sort of analyze that in more detail, notice the, the consistency of those. What do you notice that's consistent about that number, that number, and that number? What What is consistent? The numbers are different, but what's the same? I have included the units. For goodness sake, when you are when you are writing it any mathematical way, please make a point of including your units in your answer. Sometimes the exam would kind of give you the unit and you know maybe it's not as relevant, but you should be in the practice of doing that. Now, what we find therefore is if we get 72, we multiply it by 70, we get just shy of five liters. So that's gonna give you an impression of this cardiac output concept. So we've got five liters of blood going at rest around the systemic circuit. Now, I'm gonna get into this a little bit later. Just be aware of, just be aware that only 15% of that, and from memory, I think that's about 750 milliliters, 15% of that is going to the muscle at rest. Okay, and therefore we've got 85%, 85% going to other organs. I'm not going to really get into that in any detail in, 
this little bit because we're not going to touch on it a lot we've got a little bit in a question later but just be aware obviously we could talk about vascular shunting and redistribution at that point now what i do think is interesting is let's just look at exercise conditions a second exercise okay exercise now i'm going to kind of do this in reverse here exercise so if we assume there's our equals there's our multiply Let, let's assume for example uh, let's assume um let, let's take it like this we've got a situation where our cardiac, uh, sorry, our stroke volume can increase up to something in the region of 140 millilitres. So we can basically double. Now, I'd encourage you to think, you know, if we follow the principle of the all or non law, how can it be that the heart ejects more blood per contraction than at rest? Because remember, at rest, your heart is still going at full power. So you might want to reflect on how is it that we get more blood out. And I'll come back to that point in, in a few moments' time. But let's say we've got um, let's say we've got an athlete who is um, 20 years old, and they're going to have a maximum heart rate something like 200 beats per minute. Remember that 220 minus age thing. Well, if we multiply these things together, we have our cardiac output going up to something in the region of 28 liters. Now that would be a very very good quality uh, cardiac output for a decent quality athlete. Okay, so just be aware of that. That there have been cases where cardiac output can go up as even as high as 35 to 40 liters, but that's extravagant kind of levels of fitness. You understand? But the point is, we get this significant increase in both stroke volume and, of course, in heart rate range. Now, uh, in heart rate, sorry. Now, bear, bear in mind that this here is what we'd call a heart rate range. You know, if we've got resting heart rate at 72 and we've got maximum heart rate at 200, of course, that means we've got a heart rate range of 128. Anyone who's looked at Carvone in principle will know that's a particularly important number. We've also got here a stroke volume range. So we could call that an SV range. In this case, it's of 70 milliliters. And we've also got here a cardiac output range. Okay, and in this case, it would be of 23 liters, right? Now, one thing I'd like you to realize is that if we were to take cardiac output for a really highly trained athlete, their resting value would remain at five liters, but their max value, their max value would go up to whatever, to 30 for argument's sake. So as a result, their range would go would be bigger as well. It would go to 25 liters. So resting cardiac output remains constant, generally speaking. Of course, we've got a different case with heart rate. Heart rate actually does decrease in a resting format if we are highly trained. And generally, we have that figure of 60 to 80 BPM which is a classic average. You, you and I are probably between 60 and 8, give or take, depends on who we are. I'm definitely not near 60, I know that, and probably may well be over 80 these days, but 60 to 80 beats per But of course, if we get someone who is below 60 beats per minute, then we can refer to that as someone who is brady cardiac that's one word by the way bradycardic or is experiencing bradycardia so lower than uh, average um, resting cardiac rhythm or frequency which is below 60 beats per minute so that's a nice term for you to grasp hold of now i'm not going to look specifically at curves for uh, cardiac output and stroke volume but we have those on the everlearner.com going to have a study of those we have an awful lot of information on this you might find it ben beneficial what i do want oh actually let me address a point before I do this. Let me address, the, address a point that I sort of posed to you. Why or how can it be that stroke volume, considering that the heart contracts fully every time it contracts, including at rest, how can the heart expel or reject more than one, uh, more than 70 milliliters in exercise conditions? And it's because, of course, if I just draw a rather dodgy heart, whenever I draw hearts, it always end up looking like bums somehow. But, of course, what happens with this heart is we're talking about the, the the quantity of blood that's leaving the heart. Okay, so the quantity of blood that is leaving the heart is question mark, and we had it rest, it's 70 milliliters. But of course, we're not yet considering the amount of blood which is returning to the heart, what we'd call venous return. If this venous return goes up, in quantity, of course, more blood is going to leave the heart. Moreover, the heart is going to kind of swell it's going to kind of swell more. It's going to kind of like, like swell outwards more because it's fuller. Okay, I'm doing this really badly. It's going to swell outwards more because it's fuller. So think about any kind of elasticated property, including a muscle. If you stretch it further, how does it ping back? 
it pings back with more force. So it also pings back with more force because it's fuller and therefore we can get more blood out of the heart. And that's, by the way, I wasn't going to get into this, but that's called an ejection fraction if we actually calculate that. If we're able to get more of the blood out of the heart, in other words, we decrease the end systolic volume, we call that an ejection fraction. That in many ways is going a little bit further than I wanted uh, to go today. But nevertheless, you can start to see where we're starting to go down the rabbit hole of understanding here. It goes a lot deeper and we're looking at the fundamentals for the time being. Now, I also want to get onto this graphical representation. What do we have here? It is simply a graphical representation of heart rate. Note this term, submaximal. In my mind, submaximal can mean all kinds of things, but I tend to think in the sports science kind of arena, I tend to think about it just for practical terms. You can think about it any way you want. But I think about it as like a 30-minute training run. Now, if you're a cyclist or a swimmer, feel free to switch run for swim or whatever. But I tend to think about it in that way because it gives us a nice impression of what a curve might look like in the classic format within this environment. But be clear, a submaximal performance is not a sprint. It is not interval training. It is not a multi-stage fitness test. It is something which is consistent, and the term I would like to use, steady state, more of which in a second. Now, let's go over this curve because we're going to answer a question on it in a second. Notice, first of all, position A here. This is RHR. What is that, folks? RHR. I'm sure you can tell me that is resting heart rate. Where is it? Notice it's at 80 beats per minute. So this is someone who's at kind of the upper end of the normal range. Maybe someone like me who doesn't exercise enough has had a history of fitness and being fit, but at the moment it's kind of like, not so kind of, you know, oh, I've just gone through a process of judging myself there. Um, but you get the idea. This could be someone who's at the upper end of normal resting heart rate range. Now we have something interesting at B. What is it? We call this the anticipatory the anticipatory rise okay let's be clear about this this little dot here we're getting an increase in heart rate usually it's a bit more significant than this increase actually but this is as a result of the release of adrenaline okay so the adrenal glands release some adrenaline and that adrenaline acts specifically on the SA node of the heart and stimulate an increase in heart rate. So before we start exercising, look, there's exercise starting there. Before we start exercising, adrenaline stimulates an increase in heart rate through that process. Think You probably feel it sometimes as well. It's like the feeling of activation or excitation. You know, it happens in numerous aspects of life, but it happens pre-exercise as well. Now, of course, we said here we've got exercise commencing. So therefore, we've got this point here. And it's really important we get this right. We are going to describe this as a steep rise. Can I emphasize the need for you to excuse me, to use the word steep? This is not a gradual rise. This is not a kind of a, a lackadaisical rise. No, it's a steep rise in heart rate. Look, this is almost vertical. Okay, so what's happening in this process? Well, we're starting to run at this point. Remember, we're going to run consistently. It's steady state. So, you know, whatever pace I'm, let's say I'm running eight minute mile pace, which I'm very proudly tell you I once did a marathon at that pace. I'm nowhere near that level right now, but I kind of one of my achievements in life. Never mind. Only one, having said that, nearly killed me. Um, anyway, so this steady state is that they're running at that point from the start. Now, we also want to note here that, of course, we've got an area of our curve there which appears to have kind of been missed out and i'm not going to get into too much detail on that but that's what we would call your oxygen deficit okay so we'll look at that when we get, do this stuff on recovery in more detail but just know for now that's called oxygen deficit but we get this steep rising heart rate and this work in this green area is done anaerobically everything under the curve is aerobically generated everything above the curve if it's missed is anaerobically generated now so we get the steep rise then we get to point d this is what we call a steady state, okay? And let me be specific what steady state means. It means oxygen supply meets oxygen demand. Let me write it over here. O2 supply equals O2 demand, okay? So that is what I mean by steady state. Exercise ends at this point here, right here. So we get a fall in heart rate. And I want to label these correctly. So point E here. 
we want to call that a steep fall or often we call it a steep decline you guys probably already be able to tell me that's the james that's the fast component of epoch yes you're right it is but just for the purpose of this we're going to call it a steep decline and then finally here we have a leveling off or a gradually leveling off try and use that language please and understand that in that steep decline we are undertaking certain physiological processes you guys probably already know that in the steep decline in the fast component of epoch we are resaturating myoglobin we are resynthesizing atp we are um, we are recoupling or resynthesizing phosphocreatine you guys probably know that already we're not going to get into too much detail on that and in area f or by point f we're removing lactic acid and the fate of lactic acid has those four possibilities more of which in other sessions but the point is that we have this classic shape and we can interpret that graph and you guys out there need to be able to talk in the detail and the rhythm and the certainty that i've just described i haven't written everything down that's possible on the page there much of which we're going to get to in future sessions but in terms of interpretation of that graph you should be able to do that at least by the time you go and sit in that exam question well, 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 what do we have here? <clears throat> Excuse me. This graph shows Kate. By the way, I should have said earlier, I actually forgot her name, if I'm being honest. This is Kate. I was like, ah, I know this person, but I've forgotten her name. Kate is one of our athlete profiles. She's a really good triathlete, and she's managed to reach the GB squad. She's an aerobic athlete, of course. Now, <laughs> uh, now we've got a question here. This graph shows Kate's heart rate responses over a sprint triathlon event. So this is one of the shorter triathlon events. Analyze the graph, making specific reference to heart rate responses and the intensity of exercise at different stages. Okay, first thing, we should have a comma there. Okay, bad grammar kind of frustrates me a little bit, especially if I've written it. Um, there should be a comma there, never mind. So, first of all, I want to address the concept of analyzing. This comes with a little bit of a health warning. Okay, and what I'm going to say here i urge you especially if you're watching this as an individual student on demand or you're watching it at home or something i urge you to consult with your teacher on this about your specific exam board requirement for the word analyze because unfortunately different exam boards do use that word in different ways what i'm going to tell you analyze means is correct is the correct structure because analyze and evaluate are not the same thing as you're going to see as we go through these sessions but for me analyze is actually a very, very simple process. What it means is that you break something up and explain it. That is what analyzing is. Okay, so if we look at our graph, for example, how would we break that graph up into parts? Well, we've kind of been helped out, haven't we? Here's one, here's two, here's three, here's four and so on okay so we've given and, and often when we're analyzing a graph or if you live near where i live analyzing a graph um when you're analyzing it they're going to provide you with some kind of shading or, or designation for different features if they don't you can basically make them yourself if we were analyzing this graph for example of course we've been given three zones pre-exercise exercise and post-exercise and we've got kind of little sub zones in the exercise part you know like the the oxygen deficit stage for example so what are we going to do here we're going to take each of these stages in turn and we're going to analyze we're going to break it down and we're going to explain it remember if we break something down kind of language we're probably going to be using language like uh, firstly comma secondly because we're doing like little sections and so on thirdly or, or, or next comma um, when we explain something we're using things like because we're using things like through, so-and-so happens through this process, so-and-so happens by the following happening. We might also say things like this means. We might also say things like therefore, comma. Okay, that's us explaining things. Everything I've included in that, even those scribbled little words, if there's a capital, there's a reason for it. If there's a comma, there's a reason for it, and so should you. Now, let's have a little go at our answer. Let me, I've already done the answer in advance. So let's have a little go at it. I think it's this one. Yeah, a lot, a lot of words. Okay, so let's have a go at this. Let me get my red pen vet ready. So during the rest phase, so look, what am I doing? I'm simply saying during this phase, during the rest phase, comma, heart rate is 55 beats per minute. Look, I'm probably going to get a mark for that in, in reality. I'm probably, I'm probably going to get a mark for 55 beats per minute there because I've picked up a specific detail from uh, from the graph. Just one second, I just need to reach and grab something. 
I need to reach and grab two things. Um, so, where was I? Sorry, folks, I meant to have a bit of paper near me, um, and I didn't, which is annoying. So we've got this sort of notion of 55 beats per minute, and we might even get credit for saying Braddy Cardiac. I'm going to give myself just one mark for that. Link them up, spectacles. Okay, so if it was resting heart rate, heart rate below 60 beats per minute. Because she is a trained aerobic athlete, so I'm given a reason. I'm, a, I'm, I'm given my because she's a trained athlete. I might get a mark for that. Who knows? I mean, let's see. Secondly, so I'm breaking it down now into the next chunk. Secondly, comma, in the rest phase, comma, notice the use of commas here. Get it right, please. Heart rate increases pre exercise by the action of adrenaline. Two things there. I say adrenaline acting on the SA node. Look at my explaining language, in this case, my analyzing language. I'm saying it happens by this happening. So, action of adrenaline on the SA node. This is the anticipatory rise. Okay, possibly another mark. Let's connect those up and let's be harsh on ourselves and not give us an extra one. During the warm up, comma, you know, again, I'm analyzing. It's basically, secondly, thirdly, fourthly, during the. Um, where am I? During the warm up, heart rate increases rapidly. Okay, so notice the word rapidly or steeply. Okay, I'm probably going to get myself a mark because I'm explaining demand for oxygen increases at the muscle. Okay, there's my connection. Next comma, so again, I'm into the next phase. You probably already realize that I'm now into the exercise of the swim phase. During the swim and the cycle, heart rate remains relatively stable. Okay, so swim and start rate, heart rate remains relatively stable. This means, there's my language, it's steady state, boom. Steady state exercise is being achieved and O2 demand is being met by O2 supply. Would I get another mark there? Or possibly it would connect up and make the same mark. During the transitions, transitions by the way we mean, look, this little area here and this little area here. During the transitions, Heart rate falls slightly because demand decreases temporarily. Okay, I've got my because, demand decreases temp temporarily. Finally, during recovery, heart rate falls. First, rapidly, and then gradually. Let's give ourselves one mark for that. The fast and slow component of EPOC are in op operation. Okay, so we might get a, um, a mark in there. We're sort of saying why that's happening one two three four five six seven eight there's my max if it's if it's not a level question of course you do need to check that with your specific exam board and i've got my last point here therefore comma o2 deficit is rapid and lactic acid removed now before i move on from the answer i want you i want to tell you that this answer despite the fact that i think we gave some good quality responses is flawed and i'd like you to tell me why it's flawed can anyone tell me why that might be Okay, so have a little think about that. So I'm going to, I'm asking, I meant to ask you at the start why it would flaw, to be honest, but I forgot. So we covered this section, this section, we talked about this, we talked about this, we even talked about these little bits. We talked about uh, those bits and we talked here. Do you notice that I didn't talk about that section in my answer? And what do we notice about that section? The heart rate gradually goes up. And we can't tell why. You could say, okay, they're sprinting to the end. Okay, over it. You know, they, they accelerate. It's possible. But what's actually happening there in reality is an experience of cardiovascular drift. Now, I'm not going to go into this in real detail now. But cardiovascular drift is a process where heart rate drifts upwards in longer duration exercise, often after 20 or 30 minutes. And it does that because our, um, our production of H2O through the aerobic process means that we start to lose fluid we sweat we we begin to dehydrate and when that happens that has a negative effect on the plasma the fluid component of the blood which makes the blood more viscous okay so basically we lose blood fluidity it becomes less liquid if you like because the, the liquid the gel liquid component plasma reduces as we lose water and as a result the blood becomes a, a more solid robust structure and therefore our stroke volume decreases so as a result our stroke volume decreases if we go way back up here in order to maintain this in order to maintain this if stroke volume goes down what do we have to do we have to increase heart rate and that would explain this part of the graph here 
okay, that cardiovascular drift because our blood becomes more viscous, heart rate has to go up to compensate and so on and so on. So look, slightly flawed answer because I missed a bit out, um, but it's a common thing we do in, ex in an exam, isn't it? We kind of skip a bit or we miss a detail. And I guess one of the things we'd say there is it's really important to stay calm and make sure, well, Firstly, obviously, make sure your knowledge is really great. But secondly, stay calm and take your time in picking up the detail of those questions. Can I come back to the health warning briefly? If your exam board tell you that analysing is giving strengths and weaknesses, I mean, two points on that. Point one, they're completely wrong. But point two, you have to do that, okay? Because ultimately, you have to get marks in your exam. But... <laughs> It's, it's a difficult one because this is what analyzing should should really mean. And, it, and for, to be fair, many of the exam boards have nailed that down and got that right. But there's a couple still lingering who claim that analyzing means evaluating. Evaluating would be given strengths and weaknesses and making a conclusion. Analyzing means breaking something up into parts and explaining it. And um, hopefully, we, uh, hopefully that's helpful. Okay, back to the camera. Okay, super fast little mini session needed here after my <laughs> marathon effort on the last one. Um, okay, Venus return, quick. It is the quantity of blood returning to the heart. So if we note for a moment, I'll just kind of flash it down here, the quantity, of quantity I should put in there, quantity of blood returning to the heart. So if we consider for a exact for a moment that venous return is equal to stroke volume and stroke volume is the blood leaving the left ventricle and powers all forms of energy production by delivering nutrients and essential products to the muscle cell, venous return becomes an unbelievably important concept for efficient movement in sports and exercise conditions. Because if this goes down, this goes down. If this goes down a lot, this goes down a lot. And this, of course, is what we refer to as Starling, you know, the little bird, Starling's Law. Okay, Starling's law said venous return equals stroke volume. And for me, it's just common sense. Right, how much blood leaves the heart? Well, it's got to be roughly the same amount that arrives at the heart. Otherwise, you're going to have an unbalance and your heart's going to fill up or have nothing in it or whatever. So as a result, this is actually an intuitive and obvious concept. What we want to know, therefore, is how do we take this concept and during exercise conditions, make sure it's as high as possible. And that is what we mean when we refer to venous return mechanisms and I'm going to go through these super fast all right so first one I'll go through the, these obvious ones first of all we've got the notion of gravity look if we are performing um, something like we're doing a shoulder press and our arms are above our head gravity is going to drop the blood back down to the heart because it's in what we call the superior superior area okay superior means above the middle Okay, in this case, above the heart. So for those parts of our body which are above the heart, gravity will literally bring the blood back to the heart. And don't forget that when we talk about venous return, we are talking about blood, which we, which we call venal or venous blood. And it's blood under very low pressure within the venules and veins because it's so distant from the heart by that point. Okay, so especially during those uh, diastolic phases when the heart is in relaxa relaxation, the blood in the veins barely moves, if not even falls back because there's no pressure to propel it. So gravity can help with that if we're talking about something which is superior of the upper body. Now, second point, is we can do things such as raise our legs. So, I don't know, I'm going to talk about this in detail in a second. Let, let's imagine we're, um, uh, I don't know, a rugby player, and the game is uh, the World Cup, men's World Cup final 2013. I think it was, uh, sorry, 2003. I think it was, was it 12 all or 15 all at the end of normal time? So they had to play an extra time period at that point, which England then went on to win um, through, a, through a drop goal and blabbing on. But what you might find is in those breaks between the end of the game, even at half time or a timeout, even or something like an end of quarter, you might find that uh, players or performers they lie on their backs and someone kind of wobbles le legs for them, which are raised in the air. Why? Because gravity then returns that blood back to the heart. So it's one methodology. What do we notice about this? It does not. It is not partic particularly useful during exercise unless we are talking about the arms and the head. It's not particularly useful during exercise because generally speaking, most things that are moving around during exercise are below the heart. So gravity resists that flow. So we have to bear that in mind. 
Secondly, we have what we call this, I don't know why I'm going this way around, we've got, the, we've got what we call the skeletal muscle pump. And do try and use all three of those te terms when you describe this thing, the SMP, the skeletal muscle pump. So, because of, of course, if it was the cardiac muscle pump, it would be the heart, wouldn't it? Or the smooth muscle pump is actually down here, which I'm going to talk to you about in a few moments' time. So how does this work? Well, let's take, let me do it in blue, I'll, I'll draw it over here. Let's take a vein. Okay, this is a vein which is coming, uh, blood's going in that direction. Okay, uh, sorry, let me do it. Blood's going in that direction. And in this vein, we know, as, as I'll say in a second, we've got our valves, more of which in a second. So blood is being pushed up in this direction. Now, that can happen, but what the skeletal muscle pump does is we've developed a physiology, we've evolved a physiology where these veins are surrounded by these veins are surrounded by skeletal muscle now please don't judge me on the proportions of these things it's unbelievably incorrect but what have we got here we've got a vein which is passing up between muscle fibers okay between muscle fibers so let's assume that this is in our gastrocnemius for our for argument's sake this muscle gastrocnemius Let's assume this is in our gastrocnemius. Of course, as we're, as we're stepping and we're pressing and we're standing and we're jumping and we're running and we're doing whatever we're doing, these muscles are contracting. Okay, so the muscles are contracting. And as they contract, what happens? Woof, woof. It pushes that blood further up. Remember, the blood cannot go back. Why? Because we've got these valves to prevent it going back. So there's only one way that blood can go, and it's up. Okay, and that's what we call the skeletal muscle pump. So during exercise, during exercise, this one is ding, ding, ding. It's a great one because we, of course, we're moving. The muscles are contracting and forcing that blood back to the heart. What happens when we stop at the end of our 70, 90, 80 minutes, whatever, the end of our tennis match, whatever? Well, of course... We can do an active cool down. Of course, we can jog on the spot. Of course, we can jog back into position. Of course, we can sort of stand and press on our toes to keep that skeletal muscle pump going. It's something you can probably all do in your downtime and your performances to improve your performances. Next one over here. We'll come back to smooth muscle. Respiratory pump. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to be quick on this one. It's all about the thoracic cavity. As I start to exercise, as you start to exercise, what happens in our thoracic cavity, our chest? So as the blood actually comes back towards the chest area, that last most low pressure part of the venal system, the vein, you know, literally the vena cava coming back into the thoracic cavity, the thoracic cavity of the chest is pumping. And it pushes that blood back into the heart again, only in one direction. Why? because the valves prevent it going in the other way, more of which in a second. Respiratory muscle pump during exercise, ding, ding, ding. Yes, this is another reason why we do an active cool down. Smooth muscle. Okay, let's remind ourselves, if we look at a, if we look at a vein a second, we're gonna have an inner lining, okay? I'm not gonna get into the cell structure of this for today. If you're interested in that, we have, we have stuff on that already, or we have it on the Everlearn if you wanna go further. Here, we have our lumen. Okay, so that, that area there is our lumen or our space. And of course, surrounding this, don't, don't judge me on colour, surrounding this is a wall of smooth muscle. Just be aware that little white line is simply just like a measuring line. It's not actually there, okay? Just, just I don't know if that's going to confuse you. But we have this smooth muscle which surrounds the vein. And then finally, we have what I'm only going to call today an outer layer. It obviously is much prettier and smooth. Oh, what am I doing? much smoother than that but the point i want to make about this smooth muscle this purple layer in here is as blood is passing through the vein remember this is a vein here as it's as it's passing through the vein okay as it's passing through the vein this smooth smooth muscle is going to pulse it's going to constrict at times and it's going to dilate at times Okay, so we're going to have a situation here where um, imagine that smooth muscle is literally pew, 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 pulsing. And that smooth muscle 
which is operated autonomically, is experiencing changes in what we call the vasomotor tone. Tone as in muscle tone, how contracted it is. So that vasomotor tone goes up and down in a pulse. And of course, what happens then? It's like a squeezing a bag, you know, like... I wasn't expecting to produce that noise in my life, but there you go. Um, it's a pulsing action up that way. And then the pocket valves, of course, they prevent they prevent backflow. Now, note that valves are only present in uh, venules and veins. They're not present in capillaries, capillaries, arterioles, and arteries. They're only present in veins. Why? Because of the low pressure, especially during the diastolic phase within the venal system, within the venous, the veins, effectively. Okay, so that low pressure, and we've seen already what those valves do. They prevent the blood going backwards. Now, does this change during exercise? No. Does this change during exercise? Yes. Does this change during exercise, smooth muscle? Yes, because it becomes more kind of pulsing. Does gravity change during exercise? No, unless we manipulate the skeletal muscle pump. Change during exercise? Yes. So I'm not totally sure I was beeping here on my machine. I apologize, folks. Um, <clears throat> so we've got some uh, practice questions in. I've already put the answer in here because we've got to go fast. Netball matches last for 60 minutes but involve numerous passes and breaks in play. Skill, explain how. Explain how we're going to tend to find the language we're going to use is going to be things like through, by, this means, because. Okay, this is that there are others by the way, but I'm just going fast. This is the kind of language we'd expect to see in our answer. So let's have a look. How many marks am I after? I'm after uh, six. During active periods, comma, huh, good grammar, venous return is high through the skeletal muscle pump and the respiratory pump. Let's give ourselves a mark. Okay, so we're giving it uh, which, these, which are both elevated during exercise. So they both elevate during exercise. Not just this thing exists, but it increases during exercise. Furthermore, comma, huh, good grammar, smooth muscles squeeze veins because the blood is under lower pressure. So we've got smooth muscles squeezing during exercise. Remember, we've got to talk about all periods here. To begin with, I'm talking about the active period. They squeeze veins because the blood is under low pressure. Let's just link that up there. It's an extra bit of detail. And pocket valves, pocket valves must prevent backflow by operating in the diastolic phase. Let's link those things up. Mark. During breaks, I'm now on the other part of the game. During breaks, Julie should jog on the spot. Okay, why? So that's going to get us a mark. Why is she jogging on the spot? Or stretch because she can main S maintain SMP, skeletal muscle pump. Now, I wouldn't recommend you write SMP. I was running out of space. But maintain skeletal muscle pump. Finally, Julie could use gravity by laying down and raising her legs She's in the way I mentioned before during breaks to maximize her venous return via gravity. So there we get our max. Look what we've done. We, we haven't just named stuff. We've explained how it happens. Okay, and notice if I'm going to find them on that. Bye. <coughs> Bye. Uh, I, I struggle to find them here now. Through. Notice this language, especially through and by, we're using when we're explaining how something happens. Now, next question. Let me ping this in for you. In fact, let's look at the question first of all. Julie always completes an active cooldown, good for you, Julie, after training and competition, with specific reference to venous return and vascular shunt, which, <coughs> excuse me, we haven't talked about here, but we could. Explain why. Explain why are particularly going to be because. Therefore, comma. Uh, this means... If you want to get better at this, you have to look at our roadmap stuff, okay? Explain why this is so important. Let's have a look at the... Oops, pressed the wrong one. <laughs> this is because hmm, a cooldown maintains an elevated venous return through... So we've got elevated venous return through skeletal muscle and respiratory pumps. Nice. Okay, probably going to get two marks there. This means, there's my language that stroke volume remains high by Starling's law. So stroke volume remains high, Starling's law. And the muscle can be flushed with oxygenated blood. So we're talking about the muscle remaining flushed 
as a result. Now, I'm, I may have a sub-max here because I'm talking perhaps getting too many marks for Venus return, not enough for Vashel Shunt, but let's just keep going. The cooldown ensures that cardiac output is still directed, still directed to the muscle by vasodilating arterioles and pre-capillary sphincters uh, leading to the muscle. Okay, so that's going to get us a mark in there. I think we're on max already. Arterioles and pre-capillary sphincters, sorry for the shorthand, to other organs remain vasoconstricted. Okay, so what have I done there? I've explained how I'm clearly saying, um, sorry, I'm, I'm explaining <clears throat> why I'm clearly saying because this means, therefore, common, and so on and so on. I'm clearly doing that skill, and I've managed to get my language into my answer. Folks, I really feel like I've rushed you there. I hope that's been useful. You're probably going to need to watch that back because it took way too long in that first session. Sometimes this happens when things are live, and you... It's hard to get it exactly. We, t we we intend to do two sort of 16 to 17 minute sections of the teaching and I, I basically went over 20 minutes on that first one. So I apologize, it's my mistake and uh, I hope that hasn't been too desperately uh, fast paced for you at the end. Um, anyway, hopefully it's useful. Okay, let's do a little bit of breathing. Let's do a little bit of breathing. And really I should be crystal clear i'm particularly interested here interested here in breathing control so i'm going to focus on that i'm also going to touch on the notion of mechanics and i may mention things that relate to things like lung volumes but i'm not going to look at that specifically okay it's really this control point that i want to get to and by doing that we touch on some other areas we've also got a lot to cover here so it may well be sort of a chunky piece okay so let's think about uh, breathing control first of all. The main point I want to get you get you to is that we have two bunches of cells in the base of our brain that control breathing. I'm not sure how well that's coming out on your screen there. And we're going to loosely call those areas. Let me just change that color. We're going to loosely call those areas the respiratory control center. Okay, so. I would urge you to realize that this is a very blunt description of this idea. This goes much deeper than the way I'm going to describe it to you now. And if after your exam, sometime down the line, you could become intrigued by this concept, I do encourage you to read it through because it's very interesting. We're not going to get into pneumotaxic control. We're not going to get into the ponds. We're not going to get into this. But <clears throat> nevertheless, it's, it's a really fascinating area. We're just going to be scratching the surface, just scratching the surface. But we've got this respiratory control center here. And I'd like you just to notice that at this point, it's kind of separated into two little batches of cells. And you might want to know that those cells communicate with each other. Those cells communicate with each other. So that's kind of useful for you to be aware of, okay? Now, and I should say as well, they communicate via axons, okay? Which I'm sure you're studying in other parts of this course. So the whole area, the whole area is what we call the respiratory con control center. And the thing I really want to get across to you is that this gathers information. And we're going to look at where that information comes from. And we're going to we're going to look at what is done with that information. Now, the first thing I want you to realize is that although we've got sort of what we call here subconscious control, or actually not subconscious, unconscious control, it is also worth knowing that your cerebrum, this bit at the top, this kind of shaded area here, your cerebrum can take over your breathing. You know this, right? <laughs> you know this, okay? So this would be an example of conscious, conscious control. Okay, conscious control. You can take over your breathing and make it forced or quite brilliant. It's harder to go either way. If you've worked really hard in an exercise, it's hard to bring your breathing back down to resting levels because we don't seem to have the capacity to control downwards our breathing. It's more that we can go from quiet breathing to forced breathing. Okay, so we tend to go in that direction. Now, I also want to start to think about how does information get back to this area and the main point i want you to be aware of is that we have a very 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 cool structure that comes in like this and it, let me use a different color so we can see it better it comes in like this and it communicates with these cells and it's called our vagus nerve our vagus nerve and when talk about that in numerous points that if you're really interested it's also called cn10 okay i've seen that on one pe mark scheme cn10 you it's going to be on the same point as vagus nerve but you can get credit for using that term if you forget vagus nerve i suppose so this is what 
this this is the nerve that stimulates the the RCC, the respiratory control center, and gives it the information that it needs. So where does that information come from? Well, first of all, I want to introduce you to the notion of what we would call peripheral peripheral chemoreceptors, chemoreceptors. And these peri peripheral chemoreceptors exist in two places. They exist in what we call the aortic body. You know, in other words, the aorta. And they exist in what we call the carotid body. The carotid body is that big artery running up to your um, running up to your head. Okay, so in the aorta and the, and the carotid artery, we have these peripheral chemoreceptors. And the point we want to make here is that they detect chemical changes. So we've got chemical changes. And of course, we've got the notion of pH. We've got the notion of lactic acid. We've got the notion of CO2. CO2 and lactic acid make the blood a uh, lower pH, more acidic. And of course, we've got the, the notion of oxygen. Oxygen makes the blood less acidic, a higher pH. So these chemoreceptors in these two places are detecting this chemical environment of the blood and they are feeding it back to the respiratory control center via this CN10 vagus nerve. Okay, so that information is coming in there. Now, we also have, we also have a different kind, let me just go back up slightly. We also have a different kind of chemoreceptors, central chemoreceptors up here, which actually exist right next to the respiratory control center in the brain itself. And those central chemoreceptors are able to directly communicate with these cells and again, in form of the chemical makeup this time in the brain. Of course, this is a very quickly, we get information there very, very quickly. Now, we've also got other information. We've also got other information. We have, broadly speaking, what we would call mechanoreceptors. Mechano, mechanoreceptors. Okay, mechanoreceptors. And these mechanoreceptors are made up really of, of two uh, two types. So the first type is what we call baroreceptors. Baroreceptors. Okay, so this is really a key term for us. So baroreceptors, they measure pressure changes and they particularly measure pressure changes in the blood and they can also sense pressure. Oh, sorry. And they sense pressure, as, as I've just said. And what we find with these... Um, with these mechanoreceptors is they also communicate in the same way with the respiratory con control center. But we also want to be aware that our other mechanoreceptors, we have what we'd call proprioceptors, proprioceptors. And with proprioceptors, we are talking about uh, sense, uh, senses in our muscle and tendon. And what they do is they sense tension they sense tension. So if I start contracting my rectus femoris in my thigh, in my quad, for example, the uh, muscle spindle in the muscle and the Golgi tendon organ in the organ, they're, uh, in the tendon, sorry, they're going to sense the pressure, the tension changes in that muscle and tension and feed that information back to my respiratory control center. We are moving. It's likely that we're, it, it's quite likely that we're gonna need to breathe more deeply and eventually faster. Why? Because we are exercising. Now. <clears throat> we also have, we also have, let me just be clear here, we also have over here, we also have lung stretch receptors. Okay, and those lung stretch receptors also come up and communicate with the respiratory control center. And what they do is if the if the lung becomes kind of overstretched or overfilled, it actually decreases breathing depth. And this has got a nice name. It's called the herring. It's called the herring brewer reflex. So that's a kind of a protective reflex. But again, it informs the respiratory control center that that action might need to be taken. And just to be clear, this slows down breathing. Okay, so it is parasympathetic it slows down breathing in that sense so we've now got a whole bunch of information which is going up to the brain well what can the brain the respiratory control center which by the way i should have said earlier is in the medulla part of the brain or you might want to say the medulla oblongata this very ancient primal part of our brain okay 
what what therefore does the the brain do with that information and of course this is where breathing becomes kind of in one sense interesting another sense completely obvious in the sense that breathing is a mechanical process so what does this respiratory control center have the capacity to do well its basic premise is that it communicates let me just come all the way down here it communicates with a bunch of muscles it communicates with a bunch of muscles okay so for example if we start exercising indeed if we stop exercising the opposite would be the case the respiratory control center has the capacity to increase the depth of um, of a muscular contraction of a breathing muscle and it has the capacity to increase the rate of breathing by recruiting other accessory muscles to help with that process so let's go f for the basics first of all we want to know that i didn't mean to just point to the diaphragm twice there but we also want to look at the intercostal muscles here we want to know that inspiration breathing in inhalation use any of those terms inspiration is powered by contraction of the diaphragm which of course is that base of the thoracic cavity and it's powered by contraction of what we refer to as external intercostal muscles intercostal means between the ribs okay and the external intercostals when they contract they pull the ribs up and out more so the first thing the respiratory control center is going to do is going to increase the stimulation to these muscles okay it's going to increase the stimulation to these muscles make it stronger make it harder <clears throat> contract more more strength more force so what happens to that inspiration that breathing in it means it becomes deeper now if so if of course what we could say with deeper is we could say we increase tidal volume if you want to say decrease expiratory reserve and inspirit uh, sorry inspiratory reserve volume then fine that's also a beautiful description but we increase tidal volume by breathing deeper by the diaphragm and external intercostal muscles contracting with more force so at the start of exercise you're going to find that happens you begin to breathe in more deeply but eventually we begin to breathe faster and it's interesting to think about how that might work so let's say that we get a really dramatic change in pH really falls co2 and lactic acid levels are really high we've got lots of tension in the muscle we've got a big pressure change and blood pressure has increased you know we've got these we've got this information going up to the respiratory control center well now the respiratory control center is going to further stimulate what we call accessory muscles let me just write that in here accessory muscles and they happen in order okay so first of all <clears throat> excuse me first of all the respiratory control center is going to stimulate muscles like the sternocleidomastoid and the pectoral muscles or the pectoralis um, major okay so it's going to recruit those muscles first and both of those muscles relate to inspiration so in other words they're going to really <laughs> deepen breathing okay so they're going to really deepen breathing and i should also have mentioned on this image we've also got the scalenes which is also um uh, in the neck that can do this job as well so we get a deeper inspiration even deeper than just using the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles but again if we are exercising hard enough we don't just need deeper breathing we also need faster breathing and if we need faster breathing you know we want to increase our breathing frequency we recruit other expiratory muscles in other words our expiration can get faster okay and stronger so what do we have for these well we have two really we have what we call the internal internal intercostals these are very much like the external intercostals except that they're upside down so when they contract they pull downwards so internal intercostals and we also have the rectus I always worry about my spelling of this word, or abdominis. Okay, rectus abdominis. This muscle here, which actually covered in fascia within the image, but of course when this muscle contracts, it pulls everything downwards and inwards. And what that means is that expiration can get faster and stronger. So now we're breathing more deeply. <laughs> but we're breathing uh, breathing but we're breathing fast and deeply <sighs> notice how my breathing out has increased in its rate and its strength and that's happened because of the impact of these expiratory 
accessory muscles, the internal intercostals and the rectus abdominis, pulling my thoracic cavity further down and inwards, further down and in inwards. So it is, in, it is in this way that our respiratory control center controls breathing. Now, just one thing that sometimes we get credit for, it's worth knowing that our respiratory control center can be broken down into our inspiratory control center and our expiratory control center. Okay. Now, the only thing I would say in addition to that is that the inspiratory control center, it control it controls inspiration, obviously, and expiration at rest. Okay, so if you think about expiration at rest, it's just relaxing that diaphragm and external intercostals. It also controls inspiration in exercise. The only thing the expiratory control center does is it controls expiration during exercise. That's its only job. So actually, this expiratory control center is actually requested by the inspiratory control center. Just, just be aware of that, but it's a nice little piece of extra information that you can use. So this is how that respiratory control works. Okay, question. Let's have a look. We've got a real interesting one here. Now, in terms of the mark here, only some of you have the potential in your exam for a 10 mark um, uh, non-level question. So just discuss with that with your teacher whether that's the case for you or not. Some of you do, some of you don't. But we wanted to put kind of a, a bigger mark question in. So if the higher uh, non-level, if the highest non-level question you get in your exam is a seven marker, for example, consider this like a seven marker. We've put 10 because that's the highest in any of the exam boards. Here we go, discuss a really testing command word. Discuss the methods by which Kate is Kate controls her breathing before, during, and after a triathlon race, race makes specific reference to neural and chemical and hormonal, if studied with AQA factors, that influence this control. Okay, so we want to start answering this question. Now I should say, <clears throat> I should say that what we want to do here is we wanna first of all decide what this discuss means. When we look at a discuss question, generally speaking, we wanna realize that behind that command is another skill. Sometimes we have to evaluate something. Evaluate means find the strengths and weaknesses, discuss advantages and disadvantages. Sometimes we have to analyze something. To analyze means to break down and explain it in parts. Sometimes we have to compare you know, if we were to ask to discuss the similarities and differences, we might be comparing. So very often we need to explain and we may need to describe. So realize that hidden behind this command of discuss, which simply means talk about all the key details, we might perform one or more of these skills. Now, the way I see this question is discuss the methods by which Kate controls her breathing before, during, and after a triathlon. Before, during, and after after a triathlon okay so we got before during and after so for me what that makes me think about is analyzing breaking something down and explaining it it doesn't appear to be asking me to evaluate this thing word of warning if your exam board create or considers analyze and evaluate to be the same thing then obviously you're going to need to evaluate here because that's what they expect you to do i mean they're wrong but if they do it that way then obviously you're going to need to do that but here, what we're going to do is we're going to break this down into before, during, and after and explain each part. So let's have a little go at doing this. And I should say to you guys as well, you, I'm not expecting you to get the entire answer down now. I wholly expect you in the break between the little sessions that we do this evening, whenever you're watching this on demand, you spend time getting a perfect answer. I'm just giving you an indicative start point. Okay, so first part of my answer. Here we go. Before exercise, I'm breaking it down into one part. Before exercise, comma, Kate controls breathing uh, by her con respiratory control center, okay? Stimulating the diaphragm and, int and external intercostal muscles. So there's the musculature. To contract, to cause inspiration, okay? At rest, inspiration will draw, I've given a total there, 0 0.5 liters of tidal volume into the lung. In this way, the respiratory control center or the respiratory control center controls the rate and depth of breathing as well as the timing of expiration during quiet breathing, which is simply a passive process of relaxing the two muscles. So what I've done there is I've taken my before 
and I've described how that control happens. Now, of course, we're going to talk about chemoreceptors. We're going to talk about baroreceptors. We're going to talk about uh, proprioceptors. But let's start talking about that when something changes. Okay, let's look at the next part. At the start of exercise, comma, we want that in there, the blood's chemistry changes. So now I'm getting into that process. Increased production of lactic acid and CO2. And notice the word increase, not just production of lactic acid, because this is asking me about the changes between these two stages. I've got to say increased production of lactic acid causes a decrease in pH. I'm talking about change. Peripheral chemoreceptors detect this change in the carotid and aortic body and inform the RCC via the vagus nerve. Meanwhile, blood pressure increases, let's mind increase again, are detected by the baroreceptors, which also inform the, the, the RC via the vagus bundle. Furthermore, mechanoreceptors, including stretch, rece stretch receptors, herring brewer, and proprioceptors inform the RCC, and I should I should have really written there about increasing muscle and tendon tension and stretching the lung. I should have said increasing more of it. And again, here I can I can go a little bit further. This means the respiratory control center will further stimulate the diaphragm. So here's my further stimulate the diaphragm and external intercostals to deepen breathing. Notice I'm quantifying. The respiratory control center will also begin to stimulate peripheral muscles such as the scalenes and sternocleidomastoid and for forced expiration the rectus abdominis okay so i've gone through my process of basically what i've done there as i've gone before exercise stage two i've got during exercise and of course if we carried on here stage three would be after exercise and that's what i want you guys to do that's where i want you to take this question now and if you like use my start point but complete it beautifully and perfectly to produce a really really high quality answer now whether you want to consider this a 10 a 7 a 14 you have a little look at your exam board and look at what the maximum non-level question marks are and then you can get an idea of where you should be in terms of content okay but you can see here that i'm clearly performing the role of an of analyzing and for that reason i'm clearly discussing because i'm talking about the key points that relate to this okay so really important that we get those things into our answers so have a little look at that a lot of information that we see it please simply as a start point it's really important that you start to understand what analyzing means but check with your teacher that your exam board doesn't expect analyzing to be evaluating for example okay back to the next part okay we're in good shape here. Let's talk about gaseous or gaseous exchange. Look, there's some basic principles that I want to get across here. So let's start by drawing some mad little sack looking thing. And let's call this an alveolus, an alveolus. And you can see here, we kind of got one in already, but I want to draw my own little pudgy little thing here. And I want to sort of stress to you kind of how this works and be able to sketch for you how this works. Past, past our alveolus, we're going to have one single capillary. I'm actually going to redo that because I've made those capillaries look really thick, which of course is not the case. I'm actually going to depict them a little like this, a little like this. Okay, so you see they've kind of got like little gaps in them. Okay, they've kind of got little gaps in them because you know this capillary as we know is kind of semi permeable permeable means it has spaces between its lay in its layer that have the capacity to have uh, a molecular oxygen or co2 or, or, or carbon dioxide move across or move through the gap we don't often talk about that in practical sense but that's literally what we mean so let's make an assumption we've got an alveolus here and of course, what we've got inside this alveolus is we've got some bunch of O2. Let me do it a little bit better. We've got some bunch of O2. You guys should be drawing as well, by the way. And in there, we've also got, you know, we've got like a little CO2. We've got a CO2, odd CO2 in there, okay? That's in there. But we've got a bunch of oxygen because we've breathed it in and oxygen is about 20, partial pressure is about 21% within the external air. So we can describe this as having low 
PCO2, but we can describe it as having high PO2. Okay, so the partial pressure of CO2 in that alveolus is low, but the partial pressure of oxygen in that alveolus is high. Meanwhile, coming past here is we've got our flattened red blood cell, our flattened disc, which we like to describe our red blood cell, which is squeezing through this capillary, very snug fit, by the way. And inside that, or, or on that, we've got some little four protein hemoglobin. Now, please accept from me that this little green hemoglobin thing that I've just drawn here, we're gonna call this HB, okay, HB. It's way too big for this red blood cell. On each of these red blood cells, we've got about uh, approximately a million to two million hemoglobin molecules, okay? Give or take on each red blood cell. That's quite a lot. So this is, this is beyond microscopic, okay? And what we're gonna find with this red blood cell is it's gonna arrive at the alveolus at the exchange point. And of course, here's our CO2 kind of orangey over here. It's gonna be bringing CO2 back from the muscle, okay? if we're exercising or from any tissue for that matter. And what's gonna happen here, of course, is that this CO2 is gonna move across this membrane into the alveolus, okay? So this CO2 is gonna move across this membrane into the alveolus. And the reason it's gonna do that is because we have a pressure gradient. Pressure gradient. A pressure gradient, okay? A pressure gradient. <laughs> In other words, we've got more <clears throat> CO2 in the blood on the red blood cells than we have got in the alveolus. So to equalize that pressure across these, remember, gappy semi-permeable semi membranes, our CO2 is gonna blip, blip, blip across. Meanwhile, our red blood cell, which is now passing Imagine this is the same one, it's going in that direction. Our red blood cell, which is now passing by here, and we had, what color did I do originally? Uh, we had our little hemoglobin molecule on there. Okay, what's now gonna happen, of course, is that these O2s are gonna start blipping across, more of which in a second, okay? They're gonna start blipping across, so that by the time we get to kind of, where's my colors? So by the time we get to, oh God, by the time, we get to here, our red blood cell is basically absolutely covered in O2s, in molecular oxygens. And of course it's gonna go off and it's gonna car carry that to, for example, the muscle, okay? So that's how that process is actually working. I'm gonna make a couple of more detailed points, but I want you to get the big picture at this point. Now we need to think about how we explain it, but before we do that, I want to get a fundamental principle in your mind. So I want you to imagine that we're looking at one of these hemoglobins. Okay, here it is up here. I've made it gigantic for what it really is, but here's one of our hemoglobins. And let's say it's arriving at the um, back at the lung, and we know that it's got some CO2 attached to it. CO2 is also in the plasma, of course. So we've got some CO2 on our hemoglobin. Now, the thing I would like you guys to realize is that these CO2s, and let's put a load of oxygen nearby, and the oxygens that want to get onto it, they don't like going alone. Okay, so what we find is that this CO2 will not detach from the hemoglobin. It won't break down from carbamine hemoglobin into hemoglobin until the first one goes. So what we find, it's a really interesting sort of rule of biology, is that it takes a little while for, let's take it, let's say it's this one here, for this little CO2 to, to jump off. But as soon as one goes, one, two, three, all follow, okay? Now, <clears throat> equally, exactly the same happens with the oxygen. They don't wanna jump on, they, they kind of don't wanna get on there, they're reluctant, that, that, and then one of them, and I'll tell you the conditions why they would, jumps on, and as soon as one of them jumps on, brrrp, brrrp, where am I? And I've got, I've got confused with where I am. They all jump on, and this is called the principle of cooperativity. And it's going to become really important in a second when we look at the Bohr shift, 
Okay, so remember that. So this is not just kind of, they all jump on, they all jump off like getting in a taxi. It's like, no, we're waiting together and until one of them goes, then they all go. And it's important you realize that because I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you something quite complex in a second which relies on that principle. And we call that the principle of cooperativity. It's also called cooperative binding in case you read it in that format. Now, that's all well and good, but I want to get to be able to describe this process with really great language. So I've got a pressure gradient. We know we have that pressure gradient. I also wanna be able to repeat my points. I have low, partial pressure I have low partial pressure low partial partial pressure of oxygen where in the capillary in the example that I gave it would be the opposite of course if we were looking at the muscle but look in in my capillary here we have got low partial pressure of oxygen in the capillary meanwhile we have got high partial pressure. Partial pressure just means the pressure a gas exerts in a mixture of gases. High partial pressure of oxygen in alveolus. And therefore, what have we got? We've got a pressure gradient. We've got a pressure gradient. And as a result of that, we know gases always move from high to low pressure. So what must that mean? Well, the high partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus must equalize with that in the capillary. So we're gonna get oxygen moving across and attaching through cooperativity with those hemoglobin on the red blood cells, okay? Now, I also want you to know that another way of saying a pressure gradient, we could also say this creates a diffusion gradient, more of which in a second, just, just be ready to use that term. The diffusion gradient, a diffusion gradient. We can even say it creates a concentration gradient. So all of these terms are effectively synonymous, but we might want to use one or all of them in our answers. So that is how that gaseous exchange actually operates. Now, a word of warning, I'm not gonna cover it here, but for goodness sake, realize we have talked about one environment here. We've talked about the external environment of the lung here. We have not talked about the exact opposite scenario of the internal environment of the muscle. You must switch this round completely, okay? But I'm not gonna go into that because I think the principle is there. You have the idea. In that case, we'd have high partial pressure of oxygen in the capillary, low partial pressure of oxygen in the muscle cell. So of course that's gonna happen. The only thing I'd say in addition to that is remember that in the muscle cell, uh, oxygen detaches in the capillary from hemoglobin, goes into the muscle cell and binds with myoglobin. That would be the only point in addition other than reversing this scenario. Now, what I do want to talk about here is this. We have, we have, uh, we have here, we have here a graph. And I'm actually gonna, let me see if I can make this slightly small so we can fit it all onto one page. Just bear with me a second. I want this all to feature on one single page. Bear with me a second. That will do us, okay? So here. So what we've got here is we have what we're gonna call an oxygen dissociation curve. An oxygen dissociation curve. And I found traditionally that students hate this topic so I thought I'd go over it with you. So it works like this. You see on the axis on the X, we have partial pressure of oxygen and on the uh, vertical, on the Y, we have hemoglobin saturation. So this is what I'd like you to think about. So I'm gonna show you at rest to begin with. So the way this works is at rest, what we find is that the curve stays very low to begin with. Why would that be? Why would the curve stay very low to begin with? In other words, oxygen is not attaching in large quantities to hemoglobin. Why? And of course, the reason for that is exactly what I told you before about the principle of cooperativity, okay? So we've got this principle of cooperativity. The levels stay low because oxygen does not want to bind onto the hemoglobin until its mate binds on cooperativity. But once that happens, let's say it happens here, we get a dramatic increase and then we get this S-shaped curve at the end. And I want to kind of show you this point. What I'd like to do 
is I like to choose an environment which has a high, a high partial pressure of oxygen. Let's say that we are choosing the lung, okay? And let's say, let's say, let's say the lung has a really high partial pressure of oxygen, okay? So what we're gonna say here is that here, we have the environment of the lung. We have a high partial pressure. So up here, this is how much oxygen is in the bloodstream, okay? So once the, the, the blood is passed by the lung, we have this high partial pressure and we have a high saturation rate of hemoglobin. Now, we also find here, what we want you to realize is that if we now think about an environment where the partial pressure of oxygen is low, we might have something like the muscle. Okay, so let's say the muscle is this point here. Okay, and we can track that up and we can look at this point here. Okay, okay so the muscle has a much lower um, saturation of, um, of oxygen at that point. In other words, a load of oxygen has been pumped into the muscle through the diffusion. So effectively, what we can do is we can track this across and we can track this across. And then what we have is that whatever this quantity is, this is O2 delivered or consumed, or utilized, you could say. It's oxygen delivered. So of course, what we wanna do from the exercise perspective is we wanna make this difference as big as possible. So in general terms here, we're gonna have this scale of oxygen delivery to the muscle, because this is, the, if you like, the steepness of the pressure gradient. Now what we find with exercise, what we find with exercise is that the curve shifts to the right. Let me choose a different color. The curve shifts to the right, okay? And it, sh it, sh it shifts to the right because our pH, pH level falls and because our temperature goes up, okay? So if our temperature goes up and our pH level falls because of the production of CO2, the production of lactic acid, we're gonna find a different picture. This time, we're gonna get something, we're gonna get something like this during exercise conditions. Didn't actually draw that very well. I wanted to do it like here. Let's do it like that, okay? So we've got it like this. So we've now got a different situation. Now at the lung, now at the lung, I've got it, I've done it a bit extreme, if I'm honest. Now at the lung, we still have this level of hemoglobin saturation. But now at the muscle, I mean, I've, I've gone way too far, but now at the muscle, I've got this level of hemoglobin saturation. In other words, now the amount of oxygen I've delivered is way bigger. Okay, way bigger. And of course, the reason that happens is because our pH level falls, we're more acidic in the blood, and our temperature increases during exercise. Now, of course, the opposite would happen during recovery, but the point is now that we have a vastly more significant quantity of oxygen which is delivered into the, into the working muscles. And we call this, folks, we call this the Bohr shift. And there is a, refer, a reverse effect called the Haldane effect, but we're gonna focus on the Bohr shift within this particular tutorial. And of course, what we're thinking there is that because pH levels fall and because temperature is increased, as a result of those things, we have, we have, um, greater quantities of oxygen delivered. Now I need to quickly change my canvas before I show you uh, an answer demonstration. Hopefully you're gonna have time to do that. I should be straight back. Okay, nice, canvas changed and here we go. Here's our question. Making specific reference to gaseous exchange or gas exchange, explain how is my command. Before I go any further, I know I'm gonna be saying through, by, because, it's automatic, therefore, comma, this means I know I'm making that language. If you don't know where that comes from, the roadmap. 
get on it, we provide it, it's great. It makes a big difference to your exam answering. Anyway, explain how Julie is able to consume greater quantities of oxygen during match conditions than at rest. So this is not a description of gas exchange. It works like this. I have to say why greater quantities during exercise. So if I don't say why greater quantities during exercise, I'm not getting anything. Okay, because it's specifically asking me for that. If you just put everything down, you know about gas exchange here, you're not getting the answer right. Okay, it's asking you why greater during exercise. Now we're going to be quick here, so let's see what we get. Again, can I remind you, the, the way we present these answers is so that you get a glimpse in the live session and you study them on demand. Can I emphasize that to you? Someone gave me a hard time recently because they said I didn't have time to write all the words down. No, you don't, because you're going to write your own. Okay, and you need to study this and think it through. All right, anyway, there's my little lecture over. So notice, this is because, this is because there is a steeper diffusion gradient between the alveolus and the capillary. Do you notice I didn't just say a diffusion gradient? Look what I've said there, a steeper diffusion gradient. I've forgotten how many marks I'm after here, hang on. Six, steeper diffusion gradient between the alveolus and the capillary. Now I might get the mark for that, I don't know. As Julie works harder, the partial pressure of oxygen of blood becomes even lower. Look, even lower. Partial pressure of oxygen, even lower. Whilst it remains high in the alveolus. This means that more O2, look, I'm quantifying more O2 diffuses across the semipermeable, I'll probably get that mark, semipermeable membrane and binds with haemoglobin to form oxyhemoglobin. Now, I'm probably going to get a mark for that, but I'm going to be a bit harsh myself. But notice, steeper even lower, more. It's showing me that there's a difference between rest and exercise because even greater quantities. I'm quantifying in every point I make and I'm using an explanation. If this is where your question sensitivity folks is important, right? For me, it's obvious that I need to do that. It's obvious. That's exactly what the question is asking me to do. So for me, I couldn't write anything else because I know the content and the question's asked it in that way. So my only option is to answer it in that way. Now, I know some of you might think, well, you know, James, you're a teacher, yeah. Okay, but I'm also, you know, I'm just, I'm also just a normal guy who studies this stuff. Like you, you're a student of this material, like me. Where I think you guys, potentially, depending on how much of this you've done, might need some support, is just in the sensitivity of what each typical question structure wants you to do. But if it says e greater quantities, I must show that. Anyway, I feel like I'm lecturing. I apologize. I, do, I don't really lecture generally these days, and I, maybe I'm getting a bit carried away. This is also the case for the partial pressure of CO2, but happens in the reverse through high partial pressure of CO2 in the blood and a low partial pressure of CO2 in the alveolus. Now, I'm going to say for this one, I'm going to give myself a vague there. I'm going to be really harsh. Why? Because I should have said even higher partial pressure of CO2 in the blood. You see my point? I've, it's always high during uh, during exercise. Even higher in match conditions. Uh, um, and it, it would be the same in the alveolus, of course, because it's the external air. Therefore, there is a concentration gradient. Why didn't I say a greater concentration gradient? I'm not giving myself the mark. As this gradient gets steeper, thank you, uh, with exercise. At the muscle, low PO2 in the muscle and high PO2 in the blood causes more oxygen to dissociate and enter the muscle. Now I'm in there with my maxes. And bind with myoglobin. I probably get a mark for mentioning myoglobin in the muscle. The high PCO2 in the muscle creates a steeper, I've already got my max, but I would have got that. And more CO2 binds with Hb to form HbCO2, a carbamino hemoglobin, or dissolves in plasma. So the key I want to get out of that for you guys and obviously you need to study the answer in some detail but the point i want to get out of you here is that if i get a question about explain how i'm using those words through by because therefore this means have a comma this means secondly if i say if i'm asked for a change in exercise change in exercise i must if you like quantify that change steeper, more, even greater. If we were talking about mechanics, I say e an even greater force of contraction of the diaphragm. I'm quantifying the shift. And that is something I think will be really useful to you when you're explaining things. If this question was 
describe gaseous exchange at the lung, I wouldn't be doing that. I It's in this specific question format. Okay, I, I, I sort of have the impression I may have confused you all. Um, if you've got questions, let's hear them, folks. Okay, I think we are ready. So look, we've got the title here, anaerobic processes. And of course, if you look anywhere at the image here, you're gonna see that we're gonna be looking at the lactic acid system, or depending on which exam board you are with, you might call it the glycolytic system. Let me write these in. You might call it the lactic acid system. You might call it the glycolytic system, which I am definitely gonna spell correctly because it has an L after the G glycolytic system and some of you on your example to even call it the lactate system in my mind I'm talking about synonymous concepts okay so we are addressing all three of these why because they are effectively the same thing so we're going to address this be aware therefore we are not touching in this session the phosphocreatine or the ATP PC system or you might call it the a lactacid system okay we are talking specifically about the lactic acid system. Now, I also want to address with you some examples before we get into this of when this system is predominant. Now, of course, in a few moments' time, we are going to be looking at this netball example, okay? And we're going to be talking about that in a little bit of detail, all right? So you can look at certain games play. I like to be really specific with my examples of the lactic acid system or the glycolytic system. Something like, for me, a 400-meter run is a classic example of a lactic acid system powered or d predominant event. You can put 400 meter hurdles in there if you want. I also like to think about something like a 100 meter swim. Okay, so elite level something which is going to be around about a minute, something like that, a bit like the 400 meter, slightly less for elite level, but you get the point. We also could be talking about something like a full court press. And those of you that play basketball will know that's a basketball term it's the idea of pressuring in your defense really really high up the court and working 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 constantly for a period of time and of course in that situation we need to make fairly frequent substitutions and changes and use of timeouts things like that because it's quite a fatiguing um it's quite a fatiguing process and the other one we can sometimes use as an example is open play in rugby now feel free to come up with any others i'm just giving you some but open play in rugby with well, the idea of that is that the game of rugby is very stop start it has a lot of penalties a lot of ball going out of play a lot of technical uh, stops so therefore we tend to get quite a high intensity performance because there's breaks in between think of it it's kind of in intermittent but of course if the state if the ball stays in play and it doesn't break down this often happens towards the end of a match actually when a team's trying to keep the ball in play to recover points then what we find in the open play in rugby is that the lactic acid system becomes predominant within that environment and of course we're going to use the example of netball in a moment so the ball being in play for long periods of time in netball would be a similar concept although it's probably touching more towards the aerobic system more of which later on so let's see if we can start looking at the breakdown oh, and sorry one other thing is introductions the, the other thing I really or the points I really want to get to you I have certain objectives within this session I want to talk to you guys about fuel source Okay, see so if you can be picking that up as we go through this. I want to be talking to you guys about site of reaction. And this will be common. Apply these things to all of your principles, all of your energy systems. I want to be talking to you about control of en uh, controlling enzyme. I want to be talking to you about energy yield. I want to be talking to you about any byproducts that relate to the system. And importantly, I want to be talking about strengths and weaknesses to you. And of course, if we're doing strengths and weaknesses, we are doing an evaluation of the system. Make sure you have that clear in your mind. To evaluate is to provide the strengths and the weaknesses, the positives and the negatives, and to reach a conclusion about that system. Okay, that's what we mean by to evaluate. So all that being understood, let's make let's get on with this. Okay, so we've got this lactic acid system. This is the default name I'm going to use if you want in your mind or if you want to cross that out and put glycolytic system, if you want to cross that out and put lactate system, be my guest. Just use whatever term your exam board deemed to be appropriate. Now, first things first, we have a start point. Here it is. So our start point is glycogen. A couple of things about glycogen. Number one, it's our fuel source. What did I say we want to know? We want to know our fuel source. Boom. We want to know our fuel source. So glycogen is our fuel source. And I want you to be aware of, with our fuel source, with glycogen, that it is available in both the muscle 
and liver. Now, the liver store is the biggest store, and of course, therefore, that glycogen does have to be shifted to the muscle during exercise conditions. The human body is relatively efficient at moving, uh, moving <clears throat> sugar-based fuels, so it can be moved relatively easily, but just be aware that the biggest store is in the liver, but we have a store in the muscle, which, of course, we can start to think of as an advantage because the fuel source is, is in the location where the work is going to be done. The other thing we want to sort of do from here is we want to say that glycogen cannot be used in its long chain format so it's a long chain sugar so glycogen needs to be broken down and how do we break it down we break it down and by the way this is much more complex that i'm going to describe here i'm just going to give very much the surface level knowledge of this uh, or, let me rephrase that the an a level p level knowledge of this i really encourage you to study this in more detail i would even argue that glycolysis which is what i'm talking about here and i will mention this word in a moment you can make a pretty solid argument that this is one of the most important chemical reactions ever so don't think that this is the end point to your studies of this if if you if you're interested in this take it further at some point perhaps after your exam and you'll i think you'll find it really fascinating so we have this process of glycogen being broken down into a smaller chain sugar we get the concept of glucose 6 phosphate now of course you guys are probably going to latch on to this word phosphate because we know that we have to redonate phosphogen uh, back to adp to make atp and of course that's exactly what we're going to do but i want you guys to realize that look glucose phosphorylase or gpp is a controlling enzyme in the breakdown of glycogen in to glucose however that process process costs us to ATP. James, aren't we supposed to be producing ATP? Yes, but of course in these processes we have to use energy to form the basis of the process itself. But we take glycogen, we break it down into glucose 6-phosphate, and from glucose 6-phosphate we can break down into pyruvate or what we call pyruvic acid. That is done in the presence of this madly named enzyme. You see it on the screen, Call it PFK if you really don't like it. As far as I've seen, all exam boards accept the acronym PFK. But I think you guys out there should refer to it as phosphofructokinase. Notice there are no breaks hit in here. It is one single word, phosphofructokinase. And again, phosphofructokinase is my controlling enzyme. Okay, PFK, phosphofructokinase. And that breaks... A glucose 6 phosphate down <coughs> excuse me into pyruvic acid more of which in a few moments time but in that process we generate four atp so of course what does that mean we have a net gain of two atp because it's cost is two there and we've gained four there so we get a net gain of two atp so going back to our key requirements we can ask then what is the energy yield well for one glycogen for one glycogen, I'm getting two ATP. So my energy yield is one to two, one to two. Now, if I'm to tell you that the aerobic system, which we're gonna look at in a minute, gives you one to up to one to 38, would we, dis, would we consider two ATP from one glycogen to be efficient or inefficient? And the answer you should be given is it's inefficient. So come back to the evaluation, is this an efficient system at resynthesizing ATP? No, it, the anaerobic systems are inefficient. That is why they're temporary. Okay, in this case, you know, probably a maximum of three minutes, more typically around a minute of really high intensity work. Okay, so one to two. Other points before we go further. I want you guys to know as well that all of this happens in the sarcoplasm. You can call it cytoplasm if you really need to. Sarco is the prefix for muscle. Think sarcolemma, sarcomia, those of you that um, study uh, muscle structure. Sarco means muscle and plasm means gel or fluid. So it's muscle fluid. It's happening in the muscle fluid. If you want to use cytoplasm, that's absolutely fine, but I encourage you to use sarco as your prefix. It, it delineates this as the fluid within a muscle. So now we have our site of reaction we have our enzyme we have our energy yield we had one to two we got that now then this is where it gets kind of slightly negative what pyruvic acid wants to do is it wants to continue down here and become what we'd call an aerobic process however in our examples full court pressing basketball 400 meter sprint 100 meter swim what we are what we're saying here is that there is insufficient insufficient O2. 
So this aerobic process cannot continue, or this aerobic process cannot happen in a predominant or sufficient sense because the um, the intensity of the exercise or the demand for energy is too high. So what therefore do we have to do? We have to do something with this pyruvate, this pyruvic acid. And the way it works is we convert it into a product called lactic acid. And that, ha that happens in the process of lactate dehydrogenase, another enzyme. I want to say here, this is not the controlling enzyme, okay? This is not the controlling enzyme. We've already said the controlling enzyme is our PFK. But LDH, there's a, there's a break there, lactate dehydrogenase, by the way, um, it converts pyruvic acid into lactic acid, and it does so through a process of fermentation. Now, the, <laughs> as an aside, Human beings are one of the only organisms that produce lactic acid through this process. Many, many organisms have this process, but it's actually alcohol which is produced in the organism. Lots of mammals do this as well, but it's, it's also very common in, in other organisms as well, smaller organisms. Um, so instead of other animals producing lactic acid, they produce a form of alcohol. Now, that's just an aside. Don't worry too much about that. Okay, but this lactic acid for me, we don't want to leave that point now because it's useful for us in other ways. Be aware that lactic acid is energy rich. Okay, so we've only extracted a small amount of energy here, but it's also fatiguing. Okay, but specifically, it, is, it breaks down to release hydrogen ions, which are the fatiguing part. The bit that's left over, which we call lactate is just the energy part and we can use that later we actually restore it or reburn it so we can use that but the fatiguing part the hydrogen ions they do denature enzymes and prevent us producing energy efficiently okay so we obviously we need to address and remove this lactic acid which in other areas of your studies you know whether it's the buffering system or whether it's a uh, slow component of epoch we're actually doing that in our next session you, you you guys already know that we have to remove this thing but just be aware it is energy rich as well so we can well, at least lactate is so we can reuse it so let's go back up here we now have a situation where we have our byproduct is lactic acid now we need to think about our strengths and weaknesses so let's have a look at that so let's just go down to here so we've got our performer julie here okay i kind of want to scribble this Arrow, it's annoying me. I don't know why I put that in there at the start. Let's get rid of that. Um, so we've got this performer, Julie. And what I want to do basically is over here, I want to have a look at the strength, not of Julie, but of the lactic acid system for Julie. And over here, let me choose some mad red color. Over here, I want to have a look at the weaknesses. What have I written? Oh, what? I can't. I can't my handwriting's bad anyway, but I can't live with that weaknesses come on james slow down okay so let's have a look at the strengths of this system so first things first and i think this is a really important point to make there is no delay for o2 delivery so of course we're comparing in many ways there to the aerobic system we are not waiting for a delivery of oxygen we've also got the fuel source is present so can you remember that we said the fuel source is glycogen and because of that we can say the fuel source is present and we can say in the muscle okay you know when we talk about uh, beta oxidation of fat later on of course that fat is not in the muscle for the aerobic system for example but this fuel source glycogen is in the muscle and the other point i wonder if you guys can extract it from the examples i gave what would be the other point about these, another strength of these? 400 meter run, 100 meter swim, full court press, open plane rugby. What we're saying here, this is like bang, 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 intensity, intensity. So what we're saying here is that this is high intensity, high intensity energy. So in other words, this anaerobic lactate lactic acid glycolytic system is capable of producing high intensity energy but of course as we're going to see in a moment it's temporary let me pronounce that correctly it's temporary i've completely forgotten how to say that word it's the pressure it's the pressure now weaknesses well there's some obvious ones we have a short duration system okay short duration and that duration we're going to refer to as a max of three minutes 
But the point I would make is that's three minutes of fairly gentle anaerobic work. If you are really pushing hard, you're probably going to be much nearer to the to the one minute mark for your threshold. Okay, so three minutes is going to be a max for that kind of anaerobic predominant work. Don't forget all energy systems contribute all the time, but we're talking about the predominant system. We're also saying we've got a fatiguing fatiguing byproduct. And you guys already know that that is lactic acid. If you want to be specific and say the hydrogen ions of lactic acid, feel free. But the fatiguing byproduct, and it's fatiguing because lactic acid or, or hydrogen ion from lactic acid, amongst other things, prevents the operation of PFK. PFK is the enzyme which controls both aerobic and anaerobic glycolysis. So as a result of that, we can't produce more energy, so we fatigue. And finally, what would our other weakness be? You know, it should be that the system is inefficient with energy yield of one to two. And I always like to put the boot in at the end only. Okay, one to two only. So we've got an inefficient energy yield. But, you know, just as a little aside on that one, don't forget that the ATP PC system is one to one. One uh, phosphocreatine for one ATP. So this is actually doubly efficient to the ATP PC system. But we still consider it to be inefficient because the aerobic system is so efficient. So have we addressed our main points? Fuel source, glycogen, thank you. Site of reaction, sarcoplasm, thank you. Controlling enzyme, PFK, phosphofructokinase, you can mention GPP as well, glucose phosphorylase. Energy yield, one to two, thank you. Byproducts, lactic acid, hydrogen ions, fatiguing, thank you. Strengths and weaknesses, we just did them. We're in great shape to discuss this model. Now, let's have a little look at some questions. Before we do this, can I just emphasize as well that there is absolutely nothing wrong with you drawing things in your answers to your questions. You might even see me doing that in a moment, even if you're not directly asked for it. Okay, let's have a look at a question. Evaluate. We know what that means. Give strengths and weaknesses and, and reach a conclusion. Evaluate the contribution of the lactic acid glycolytic lactate system to the resynthesis of ATP during Julie's match performances. Okay, fine. Let's have a little look at it. Let's have a little look at it. Here's my first part. Notice, look, I'll just kind of underline in orange, a strength. I'm not messing up. I'm not introducing this answer. Why would I? Just answer. Just answer. A strength of the system. I'm straight in. A strength of the system is that there is no delay in O2 delivery. So straight away, I'm giving the mark. I'm picking up mark. I'm giving a strength. Then again, look, I might not a weakness. A weakness is that the system is short duration. I should have given myself a mark there. Is short duration lasting a maximum of three minutes. Circle, kind of, tick, one mark. But can you see how that first point does something very base? I go strength, I go weakness. Feel free to go weakness and strength. If you really want to, go weakness, 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 strength, strength, strength. That's absolutely fine. For me, on just this six mark question, I like to go one strength, one weakness. That's just personal choice, but if you want to do it the other way, that's your choice. But you must present both sides. Next little batch. On the one hand, beautiful prefix to use when you are talking about um, evaluation. On the one hand, and don't forget that comma, on the one hand, so I'm, I'm going to give sort of either a strength or weakness, the lactate system offers high intensity energy. There's my strength. But on the other hand, my grammar is correct, my use of commas is correct. But on the other hand, lactic acid is a fatiguing byproduct. Thank you. So I'm clearly evaluating. Here's my next point. A final weakness. So again, I'm, I'm talking about strengths and weaknesses. A final weakness is the inefficient energy yield of one to two. Circle tick one mark. Uh, one to two, two moles of ATP from one mole of glycogen. So I've just made sure I give my knowledge there. And finally, however, comma. So I'm now onto the negative. This is double the yield of the ATP PC system. Now, this one, you're either going to get here a benefit of the doubt or you're going to get a vague 
here, whether this appears on the mark scheme. Let's be super nice to James and let's say that appears on the mark scheme because it's more than the ATP PC system. But you, for six marks here, you know, is that last, that six one, is it clinically, is it absolutely definitely a weakness, of, a strength of this system? If we go back to what we wrote here, what would I have been better put in there? I maybe would have been better put in there fuel sources in the muscle. Okay, so maybe I should have done that. Now, the other thing I've said, I wanted to say here is in this one, in any kind of evaluation, you really should reach a conclusion. I stopped there because, A, because it was a six mark question, but also I was kind of out of space a little bit as well. And I don't want to sort of go on too long on these things. But with the conclusion, what you want to be doing there is you want to be saying something like, in conclusion, the lactic acid system is perfectly structured for short duration, high intensity bouts of exercise, such as in Julie's performance, a, a, a high press trying to win the ball back in open play. That would be where the conclusion comes in. The other weaknesses of my answer, I feel, the other weakness of my answer is I don't feel I've related back to Julie enough. And when you submit your answers to us, I encourage you to do that a bit better than I have. Nevertheless, let's move on. Describe. Describe means that we are going to give the composition, the composition, we're going to give the characteristics. Okay, I don't need to explain why characteristics I don't need to explain why. I'm going to say what it is, what it is like. I'm going to do those kinds of things in my answer. So describe the lactic acid energy pathway. It's a pretty simple question. Let's see what we come up with. The lactic acid system is characterized by, what did I say over here? Characteristics. Characterized by. Now, what do we need to characterize our system by? Fuel source, energy yield, byproduct, blah, blah, blah. By the site of reaction being the sarcoplasm. Lovely. Looking for full marks. And the controlling enzyme being PFK. Lovely. The energy source is glycogen. Lovely. And the energy yield is 1 to 2. Now, probably that's all I need to do. But what I wanted to sort of stress to you guys is why wouldn't I draw? Now, talk to your teacher about this. I am a big advocate of drawing in your exam. Now, if you're doing a question, I don't know, history of sport, someone asks you about, <clears throat> I don't know, differences between popular recreation, don't bother drawing mob football in comparison to association football. It's pointless. Okay? But what you might be able to do is in this visual structure, you might just chuck a point in here that gets you a mark. So, for example, let's say it only picked up three here for argument's sake. Would I get a mark now by saying, ah, uh, there's the two ATP. I didn't mention the word ATP up here. So now he's mentioned it here by drawing it. So I get it here. He said that pyruvate is converted to lactic acid. Could that have got me a mark, for example? So don't leave knowledge in your head. If you think the drawing is relevant, draw. I can't emphasize that enough. Again, don't bother if it's completely pointless and meaningless. I'm going to draw Albert Bandura because he was the founder of social learning theory and he had a, he had a nice, pretty face. Don't bother. It's pointless. But this is not pointless. This is relevant. And therefore, I encourage you to use drawing in your answers <clears throat> when it's appropriate. All right, we need to move on. We're going to be back with the aerobic system briefly. Um, yeah, straight back to you. Okay, now into the aerobic processes. Uh, the first thing I want to remind you is that we've kind of already, well, not kind of, literally, we have already covered this section in, this, in, in the period we just did. So if you're watching this on demand and you haven't seen the first kind of teaching episode, the first 20 minutes of this, then you need to do that because it covers this material. And I, I'm not going to go over that because I'm, I'm going to have it as assumed knowledge. But what changes with what we going to talk about now is this point here. We are going to now argue that there is sufficient there is sufficient oxygen for this to happen. Okay, so we now have sufficient, whereas previously, if I go back up here, we had we had here insufficient. Insufficient. Insufficient O2 up here. So we can now start thinking about we can now start thinking about an aerobic breakdown of glycogen after it's been converted to glucose 6-phosphate into pyruvic acid. Very little has been converted into lactic acid through the process of fermentation in the presence of LDH. And now we can have a look at the next steps. Now, I also want to remind you that we are looking for 
fuel source. We are looking for site of reaction. We are looking for enzyme. We are looking for energy yield. We are looking for byproducts. And we also want to look for strengths and weaknesses. Okay, so we get a shared experience with our first energy system, except that the content can be slightly different. Or you would think, because again, the fuel source here is glycogen. In a few moments time, I'm gonna to start to talk to you about fat triglyceride and how that can be used in the system. But first of all, we can have glycogen as our fuel source. Now, the site of reaction, which I'll come to in a second, is different. But we want to start from this point. We have our pyruvate. Pyruvate, <clears throat> pyruvate is effectively converted into acetyl coenzyme A or acetyl CoA. Now, the way we kind of depict it is acetyl CoA is uh, changed into citric acid and then goes into this Krebs cycle. But in reality, what's happening here is that acetyl CoA and citric acid are being carried into this Krebs cycle together. Okay, so just be aware of that. But nevertheless, we have this citric acid product and it's citric acid, which is going to spin in the Krebs cycle. And through that process, we are going to resynthesize two ATP and we are going to produce CO2 as a byproduct. So we have one of our byproducts now as CO2. We've got another two ATP in addition to our glycolysis based 2 ATP from earlier. So we now have up to 4 ATP from our one glycogen mole of our energy source. Other points I'd like to make, we have the Krebs cycle is taking place in the mitochondria. Okay, this mitochondria is an organelle within the muscle fiber and effectively it is the destination for all um, it's a destination for all oxygen that enters the body. In other words, it is the aerobic factory. They produce aerobic energy. That is where that happens, the mitochondria. Now, it's beyond the remit of this little session for us to talk about the fascination that is the mitochondria. Without getting kind of too weird about it, we genuinely don't know where mitochondria have come from. They do not contain human DNA. It's kind of a weird thing. Now, I'm not suggesting anything crazy, but it's kind of interesting just to have in your mind, study it a bit, have it in your mind, and just let it float around in your mind and start to think about different possibilities. It's really fascinating. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not going alien route here or anything, or anything conspiratorial. What I'm saying here is that this is kind of an inexplic inexplicable feature of our, of our biology. And for that reason, it's really fascinating. Anyway, I'm, I'm blabbering on about stuff that's not useful. So... Another product of our Krebs cycle is that we produce hydrogen ion, hydrogen ions, I should say. And those hydrogen ions, again, within the mitochondria, are carried into our ETC, our electron transport chain. And effectively, in this process, they are stripped of their electron. And when we strip this hydrogen ion of its electron, we get a very large an efficient production of ATP, and we produce water. This goes some way to explaining why the production of water, which meant much of which would be sweated out, for example, or breathed out through water vapor, it goes some way to explaining how things like dehydration can begin to happen, because we produce this water as a byproduct along with CO2 from the Krebs cycle earlier. So what, of course, we get here is we get an ATP net of 36, We've got R2 from earlier, so we can make an argument that our aerobic system has a yield of 1 to 38. 2 from glycolysis, 2 from the Krebs cycle, 34 from the ETC, giving us up to 38. And I should say it is up to. The system is not always as efficient as that. Okay, but it's up to 38. Now, a couple of other things I want you to be aware of. We have another fuel source that we can use, and I mentioned it a few moments ago. We could also use what we call triglycerides. Triglycer what am I doing? Triglycerides. Now, use the word fat if you prefer, but triglycerides also can enter the Krebs cycle. And they enter the Krebs cycle in the presence of an enzyme called lipase, lipase. And this process of breakdown of triglycerides has a really nice name. We call it beta oxidation and the key point i'd like you to realize with regard to fat i'm going to do a 
touch one detail in a second, is that fat produces very large quantities of ATP. However, the downside to that is that it's quite inefficient. We have to deliver the fat to the muscle and we can't deliver it in very large quantities. So it's efficient in the sense that it produces lots of ATP, but it's inefficient in the sense that it takes quite a bit of a process to get fat to the muscle for processing. Now, of course, people like aerobic athletes have become very much more efficient at that process, so can do this better than those of us that might be untrained aerobically, for example. Now, Let's go back to our tick list. We've got our fuel source. We are saying both glycogen and triglyceride. I'm not going to get into proteins entering the Krebs cycle at this point. If you're interested, go and research it. Site of reaction. We have, where have you gone? We have the mitochondria. Enzyme. We've got two that could potentially get us a mark here. We have got PFK, which is involved in this glycolysis stage. And we've got lipase. Those enzymes can get you a mark. Energy yield. Generally speaking, you're going to get a mark for saying 1 to 38. In most mark schemes I've seen, you'll get the mark for saying 1 to 32 up to 1 to 38. So anything in between those numbers is going to get you the mark. But my recommendation to you to simplify this is to use the term 1 to 30 or use the energy 1 to 38. Efficient, of course byproducts we know these byproducts <clears throat> are co2 and water you might be saying to me james why don't we have hydrogen ions as a byproduct because this is then used in the etc so it doesn't get left over byproduct is something that's left over we have co2 and water how would we get rid of those we breathe them out in a case of water we can sweat that out okay so that's that now strength and weaknesses i'll cover in just a moment all right now a couple of other things for me examples what would be our classics we've got a marathon runner we've got a triathlete we've got something like a midfielder think about games like hockey association football for example or a rover in aussie rules or something like that i don't know why i came up with that example but the other thing i'd say to you is really important is recovery okay the um the recovery process is also aerobic. So if we go back to stuff we did on the aerob anaerobic stuff earlier, we know that it's high intensity with breaks because the fatigue happens. Well, the recovery is aerobic. So, of course, the recovery processes are dominant in recovery. That's why HIIT training is considered an aerobic method, even though it's very high intensity and very short duration, because we're stressing the recovery systems and those recovery systems are aerobic. Now, let me just drag down a little bit. Let's look at strengths and weaknesses for Kate. This is Kate, our triathlete. Let's look at strengths and weaknesses. So we have got, oh, let me put strengths here because we want to be able to evaluate if we're asked to do it. Let's put weaknesses over here. So what do we have? So on the strength side, we have a high energy yield. Okay, high energy yield. And try and be specific, we've got 1 to 38 in comparison my headphones are going a little bit funny here in comparison to the other systems which are 1 to 1 and 1 to 2 so we see an efficient system here we've got a long duration system i'm going to talk a little bit about duration a bit more detail imminently but the, the key number i'd say to you about du long duration is we have enough glycogen store to go about two hours at, at, at moderate intensity so around two hours is considered to be that kind of duration but of course if you refuel and you use your fat stores cleverly you can go far longer than two hours which explains why people are able to do things like marathons certainly marathons i do a lot longer than two hours um some others go pretty fast you've got the notion of you know triathlons ironmans this kind of thing where you've got um, road cycling where you've got much longer duration and that's um uh, that's that that's how that happens is you've got high energy yield We've got long duration exercise. And again, we've got no fatiguing byproducts. Now, you might say, well, there's CO2 and water, James. Well, yeah, but they're not fatiguing. In fact, if we go back to what we studied, if you did the session with us yesterday, the presence of CO2 actually reduces the pH of the blood and the muscle, and that encourages the bore shift where we're able to dis dissociate more oxygen into the muscle. Okay. The problem is if we start producing a lot of anaerobic and lactic acid-based work, that of course can lead to fatigue. On weaknesses, 
on weaknesses, of course, we've got a delay for O2 delivery. You know, you might want to think about the notion of the oxygen deficit on that one as an example. We've got the delay for O2 delivery. We've also got that this is low intensity energy. I often use the term moderate intensity, but as a criticism here, we're going to say that it's low intensity energy. We can't produce dramatic, powerful movements aerobically. Uh, aerobically. We have to do that anaerobically. Okay, so we've got the delay for O2 delivery and we've got low intensity energy. Okay, so we've got two weaknesses and one strength. I have the impression I'm forgetting the weakness. If, if I am, I'll come back to it in a few moments time. Okay, let's move on. One quick thing before we get into the questions, I just want to depict something for you. Let me just draw a very simple graph for you, very simple graph. Okay, so here, here what we've got is we have got on the x-axis, we have got time. On the uh, y-axis, we have got percentage contribution of energy. Okay, now what we find is that if I take sort of a reddish curve, and this reddish curve is going to be fat, and let me take a yellowish curve, and this um, this yellowish curve is going to be glycogen, what we find is that over time, fat becomes the predominant aerobic energy source, and that this crossover point here is approximately 20 minutes. So it's a nice thing for you to realize after 20 minutes of steady state exercise, fat would become the predominant fuel source because it's getting to the muscle in sufficient quantities. However, we could change this to be basically exactly the same graph. Okay, so let me just draw it in here. Exactly the same graph, but this time, if we put intensity of exercise on the X and we still have percentage contribution on the Y, contribution on the Y, what we're going to find here is effectively the same model. So this time, and I would encourage you to reflect on this, this time, the higher the intensity we go, the higher the intensity we go, this time, the glycogen becomes predominant, the harder we're working, aerobically I'm talking about, and fat or triglyceride becomes less and less contributing the higher the intensity we go. We're talking about intensity up to the level of moderate. We're not talking about going into anaerobic work here. But if you notice here, as we start to work harder, as we start to work harder, we get a crossover point where, okay, we want to use fat because they're more efficient, but we're working too hard. So what does that mean? It means that, for example, a marathon runner in the opening of a race should not burn too much glycogen early on, and they should make sure that both half of the races are equally paced, maybe with a bit of a push towards the end, okay? So this is a really interesting thing to think about because, of course, if we're working aerobically and we start to push a bit harder, a bit harder, then, of course, we're going to be burning less and less fat, more and more glycogen, and we're more uh, we're more likely to deplete our glycogen stores. So useful things for you to consider. Okay, question. It's an analyze question. Remember what I am advising you that analyze means. It means to break something down, break something down, I'm rushing and I'm not writing properly. Apologies, folks. Break something down and explain it. Okay, now, health warning. If your example claims that analyzing is the same as evaluation, then you must do an evaluation. Okay, I'm not going down that road again, but this is what analyze means. Analyze is the role, uh, sorry, analyze the role of the aerobic pathway for an endurance athlete such as Kate. So, how does the aerobic um, pathway contribute for, to Kate and I might be asked to analyze so I'm going to break it down so my breakdown is going to be the first 20 minutes it's going to be the rest and it's going to be I mean the rest of the race after 20 minutes and it's going to be the recovery that's how I'm going to break this down for her okay that's how this is I'm going to break this down for her let's have a little uh, let's have a little look at it first thing firstly comma in the opening 20 minutes, so I'm defining which section I'm looking at, in the opening 20 minutes of the swim, energy is predominantly provided by the breakdown of glycogen. Okay, so glycogen, how many, I've forgotten how many marks I've got to give here, up to eight. 
glycogen is dominant in the first 20 minutes. So you can see straight away, I'm answering that, I'm breaking it down, and I'm saying, I'm explaining it, because I'm putting in, it happens by, or provided by. That's a classic explaining piece of language. So glycogen as a fuel source. Let's go a little bit further. Big piece of text here. Let's just go through it slowly. This means, I'm explaining, look, there's my explanation. This means glycogen is broken down into glucose 6-phosphate in the sarcoplasm. Let's assume I get a mark for that. And then into pyruvate by PFK. Now, let's assume now I've got four marks in that first part and I've got a submax. So maybe I can only get four marks for talking about the first 20 minutes of exercise. Then it's pyruvate, two ATP net are produced through this process before pyruvate is, so look, I've got all my key information here. Key information, I'm describing my system, or I'm explaining it. Um, so hydrogen enter the, the ETC, causing 34 ATP. I'm getting good quality information, but I've got to go onto the rest of the race. I've got to analyze, I've got to break this down. Let's have a look. Secondly, after 20 minutes, triglycerides become the dominant fuel source. Entering the Krebs cycle after processing by the enzyme lipase, being broken down through the process of beta oxidation. Okay, so I've got three more marks there. So I'm getting towards my max. Can you now see that I've broken this down into the first 20 minutes, the next part of the race? And what I've left us with is, is a, a challenge to say finally, finally, comma, Finally, what? Let's go, let's put a little bit in. Let's see what we come up with. Let me choose the right color. Finally, during transitions and immediately after crossing the line, the aerobic system becomes the recovery system. Now, we're going to get marked for that. So it becomes the recovery system in that in that zone. I'm, I'm up to my max. Now, if you wanted that, I suppose you could talk about the aerobic system contributing to fast and slow component of EPOC. It, it kind of stretches the, the remit of the question a little bit. So you've got to be a bit careful not to go too far down that rabbit hole. But you could give a bit more detail there if you want to. So we could be talking about uh, we we uh, resynthesize ATP, re, uh, resaturate myoglobin with oxygen. That's aerobic. And we, um, we, we recouple phosphagen and creatine to make creatine phosphate in the fast component of EPOG. You could put that in there. I just think you've got to be a little bit careful to go too far down that because effectively touching into that other topic. You OCR our students out there however synoptic synoptic so there's lots of chances for you to do that if the question permits you to do it okay so look nice answer we've got the feature of sub marks we've got to our max we know that analyzing is breaking down into my groups or my areas you know it could even be that what they do here is they present you with a graph and you get your classic shape like this and it could even be that what they do is they kind of shade it for you so here's the first part here's the second part and here's the third part they could even ask you to to analyze this so you would talk about that part that part and that part you get lots of questions of that model if that's the case this is your first chunk this is your second chunk this is your third chunk but in this case i've decided to break it down into the first 20 the rest and the recovery and of course the reason i've done that is because of what we said here. After 20 minutes, fat becomes the predominant system. First 20 minutes, glycogen. We could have also talked about energy, uh, sorry, intensities changing. That maybe have, would have been relevant in that uh, answer as well. But then never, nevertheless, I think we've got a good quality, good standard answer. Okay, back to the studio and we'll wrap up with some questions all being well. So here we go, a bit of recovery. Now, let me be super clear here. In session one, we're going to talk about sort of the the general structure of uh, of recovery, and in sort of the second session today, um, especially for you guys who take live, if you're on demand, obviously you can you can skip backwards and forwards. But um, for you guys that are on the live stream today, what we're going to do is we're going to get into real specifics of epoch. Okay, so just be aware that 
in this first session, I'm going to try and give you the big picture before really, really drilling down in that second part. So if you wonder in the first section, why isn't he telling us all the details about the fast component or uh, the lactase component, or whatever, that's why, because we're going to kind of cover that in the second part. So all that being said, let's start to figure out and make sure, let's make sure we understand what recovery is. Is. Now, we are going to touch in a moment on recovery during exercise, but at least to begin with, we're going to consider or assume that the re recovery we're referring to is a post-exercise state. And of course, that's going to lead us to that concept of epoch. However, don't be shocked to find out in a few minutes' time that, re that the epochs can occur during exercise when when activity is kind of more intermittent, like a game play where you have a quiet moment. Of course, we also recover in that moment. It's not the end of the match, but it's the it, it's, a, it's a quiet time when we recover in that period. So just, just be aware of that big picture. Okay, so this oxygen consumption curve here, I don't think it's going to shock anybody or surprise anybody. Note to this word up here, this is a sub-maximal performance. So if you like, consider this to be something like a 20-minute training run, 20-minute training run or equivalent. You know, the, the, the simplest... A uh, piece of continuous training that we might be able to analyze. You make it a swim, make it a cycle, make it whatever you want. But let's make sure that we're understanding that that's what we've got here sub maximal, non maximal performance. So we have on our axes time. Time is passing over there. And we, as I just said, from here to here, we might assume it's something like 20 minutes. Okay, something like that. Make it 30, doesn't matter. This is just illustrative. That was hard to say. It's just illustrative. Illustrative. You know what I mean. It's just illustrating this situation. We have, first of all, here we have our resting level, not of heart rate notice, because on the y-axis we have oxygen consumption. Now you might say, James, that looks like a heart rate consumption, a heart rate graph, heart rate response to exercise graph. Yes, it does. It's the same shape. Oxygen consumption happens in the same way. We also get our anticipatory rise in the same way. Don't forget that this is a release of adrenaline, which acts to both increase uh, the rate and strength of uh, heart contractions, but also of our breathing depth. Okay, so as a result of that, so the adrenaline acting on the SA node, for example, we effectively start delivering more oxygen into the body and consuming more oxygen. So we get that anticipated rise again. But of course here, let me just go for some kind of stronger color here we get the start of exercise. Now, of course, in a perfect biological system, what we would find is that our oxygen consumption would go straight up and would go like that, okay? But of course, we are not a perfect biological system. We have to respond and gradually increase our oxygen consumption. So as a result, we actually build up a deficit Okay, and this is the deficit we're talking about, this one here. It is an oxygen deficit. It is an oxygen deficit. And let me make sure we understand what we mean by an oxygen deficit. Okay, we are talking about a quantity, a quantity of oxygen that would have been used, that would have been used would have been used if it were available okay so we're saying therefore we're saying therefore that in this period here and this quantity here because remember anything above the graph indeed anything below the graph is oxygen that was consumed anything above the graph is oxygen that wasn't consumed but we know that this is the required rate for the steady state uh, exercise so we're saying here that there was a batch of oxygen that we couldn't get to the working muscle and consume in this period that we would have used if it were available so it therefore leads to a question how then was that energy produced and of course the energy was produced anaerobically okay it was done anaerobically so we had to fulfill certain anaerobic processes for that energy to be produced so think about your lactic acid system to a lesser extent think about your atp pc system this is how that work was done for the remainder of the exercise we have a steady state relationship steady state means that o2 demand she got this the wrong way around equals o2 supply you can put that the other way around it doesn't really matter because it's equal on both sides but so here 
we are getting the right amount of oxygen into, into our muscle that is required by the muscle to generate uh, enough energy in that moment, okay? Even though we've still got this deficit over here, okay? Even though we've still got this deficit over here. And what we find, of course, is that the end of exercise, there's our kind of end of exercise line. What you might expect in a perfect system is that our oxygen consumption drops and goes like that. But of course, we don't have a perfect system. And rather than that, we have to recover and repay the oxygen deficit by this process of epoch. So let's get it crystal clear. What I'm now shading in is yellow. Let me choose a different color. What we're now shading in is green is a quantity of oxygen that was consumed post-exercise over and above resting levels that is repaying this oxygen deficit over here. So a couple of things on epoch. First of all on epoch, let's make sure that we know that epoch is excess post-exercise, one word folks, post-exercise oxygen, oxygen consumption. Now in many ways that says what epoch is, but I want to give a crystal clear definition. So let me just, uh, sh I, should, I should have space here. So this is my definition. <coughs> um, Quantity, or you can obviously you can put you can put a, an article in there, say a quantity, quantity of oxygen consumed post exercise, as we've just seen, over and above that which would have been consumed at rest so let's just draw let's just make sure we get conceptually this idea we're saying that obviously this here this here is our resting level that is our resting level okay you see here whatever that oxygen consumption is there that is our resting level and basically what we're saying is that this oxygen consumption did happen post exercise and look it is above the resting level. It is above the resting level. So it's a quantity of oxygen consumed post-exercise over and above that which would have been consumed at rest. So this is heartbeats. This is respiratory muscle contractions. This is smooth muscles which are still directing oxygenated blood to now the worked muscle, what was the working muscle. And it's repaying this oxygen deficit. So that for me is a really, really, really important big picture. Now, despite the fact that I've made this a terribly ugly graph, let me just remind myself what other images we have here. Oh, let's go to here. So so for me, the really important thing here is that we can also, reason, by the way, this is exactly the same curve look. This is the O2 deficit. Then we have epoch post-exercise. The only difference is here is that we could consider this to be like um, um, almost like a maximal performance curve. You know, it peaks and then we and then we fatigue. But the point we're making, if I just go back up to the original, we basically separate we basically separate epoch into two periods. What I've now got is the blue period and the green period. Now, they're not literally separate. They merge and overlap one another. You guys know this because it's common sense. But what we can say here is the features of the two components of epoch are really, really different. So if we look at this first um, this first component, we're gonna call it the fast or the A lactacid component in a moment. That first component, which is the kind of this ready color, it's what we would call a steep decline. Steep decline, okay? I'm gonna talk about the details of it in a few moments time, okay? It's a steep decline. Whereas if we take this slow or lactacid component, this is what we might call, I don't know how well you guys can, let me, let me write this on the black. This is what we would call a leveling off. Okay, you see how the, the, the fall gets much more gradual here. It's much more gradual where it's very steep here. We've kind of exaggerated it a little bit, but you get the you get the idea. We get an actual full. And the other thing is, in terms of oxygen consumption, you can now get specific detail that we're talking about a volume of oxygen in liters per minute. Okay, in liters per minute. So we could literally, we could literally, we could literally measure this quantity. More of which in a second. We could also literally measure this quantity more of which in a second. So let's think about Josh for a moment. 
His performance, first of all, his performance is anaerobic. We all know that. He's, <laughs> I don't know what I've written. Anaerobic. His performance is anaerobic, okay? So as a result of that, as a result of that, he builds up an oxygen deficit, okay? In his race, let's take the 100 meters, he does not breathe, probably, okay? He may well hold his breath for his, for his race, so he does not breathe. Now, if you think about that for a second, if he's not breathing, by definition, that is not aerobic work. So what does that mean for him? It means that post-exercise, post-exercise, I'm rushing here, folks, forgive me. Post-exercise, he must recover. And the point I'd like to make to you is that that recovery is aerobic, okay? So what we're seeing here in this curve is that the epoch period post-exercise is a period of time when the aerobic system is in operation. Now, for those that took, your, took the session I did yesterday live on the energy systems, you'll know I referred to this. I referred to that aerobic system, that mad system of glycogen breaking all the way down into Krebs, ETC, forming 1 to 38 HP. That isn't just for when we do a triathlon that isn't just for when we run a marathon that isn't just for 10 kilometer runners it's also the recovery system so get it clear in your mind that this epoch is an application and presentation of the aerobic energy system which is going through numerous processes to allow us to recover aerobically i got a little bit heated there forgive me folks sometimes i get a bit carried away now that is the big picture the only other thing i wanted to say at this point is and shall I tell you it or shall I ask for feedback? And no, let, let me let me sort of pose it. So if you look at this area here, and this kind of looks like I've had some kind of uh, spray paint accident. Okay, if if you look at this area here, you might notice it's quite similar to this area here. Okay, it's quite similar. It looks kind of the same. One's above the curve, oxygen that wasn't consumed. One's below the curve, oxygen that was consumed. And you might be able to think to yourself, well, O2 deficit equals epoch. And you could have a comfy sort of feeling of, oh yeah, that makes sense. That's that's kind of, that seems about right. We build up a deficit and then we basically repay it afterwards. And everyone would be like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. But what else do you notice about the size of these areas? Can you see that the Epoch one is probably 15, 20% larger? And that is because this relationship is not true. O2, O2 equals Epoch but Epoch has some other stuff on its side. So on this side, we have to have, or I didn't mean to put it into equation actually, O2 deficit, we can consider to be equal to Epoch. However, here of course, we've got a load of heartbeats, muscular contractions, respiratory muscle, diaphragm contractions that did not happen. Here, we've got a load of heartbeats, diaphragm contractions, respiratory muscle contractions, smooth muscle contractions that did happen to power this period so within this area it's slightly bigger in the epoch area because it also includes all of the oxygen which powers that heart contraction which powers that diaphragm contraction which powers that smooth muscle constriction and dilation for example so this by definition this multicolored madness has to be slightly bigger than the oxygen deficit okay i'm not going to labor that point anymore because it's ultimately not super important let's have a look at some questions Look closely at this graph of oxygen consumption. It should feel familiar. Explain why. I've seen that term. I know now I'm going to be saying because. I'm going to be saying therefore, comma. I'm going to be saying things like this means. I'm going to be saying things like this causes. And I might even say things like through and by, although we tend to use those more for explain how, but nevertheless. So these are the words that I really, as soon as I see and explain why, I know I'm including them in my answer because that's what explaining language is. I mean, that's not an extensive list, not an exhaustive list, but that's what explaining why is. So let's have a little look at this, please. So let's, let's get started. So explain why the green area is present. So why is that there at all? Okay, so let's go through. This is because an oxygen deficit has been created, okay? And, you know, if we were asked for it, we could actually draw that in, couldn't we? There's my oxygen deficit there. Okay, an oxygen deficit has been created. And air, so we're going to get, obviously, we're going to get, um, we, uh, hopefully, 
we should get a mark for saying because there is an oxygen deficit we're looking for four and area a represents epoch so i've named epoch now i have to say i was just looking at my answer a moment ago i'm a bit disappointed because i really do think that i probably should have defined epoch at this point and said what epoch is because it's all about that so the only thing i'd say to you is if you look at what the next question is if this was part of the same exam paper then we might not get definition mark twice right so epoch is the repaying of the oxygen deficit. We might get a mark for seeing repaying oxygen deficit, possibly, okay, possibly. Let's move to the next part of our answer. The anaerobic processes, so I'm saying it's anaerobic in the oxygen deficit, have produced lactic acid, broken down CP, and utilized stores of ATP. So that's what's happened here. That's what's happened here. And these are restored and resynthesized post exercise in the process of epoch and there hopefully is my max okay now would i get some extra credit for saying um produce lactic acid broken down cp utilize stored atp possibly but i'm ultimately being asked about this so it's about resynthesizing those things okay so there's one little answer for us notice <coughs> things like because that i've used it in there <coughs> So we've, we've got the through that's in there, for example. And I'm not going to go through the whole answer again, but we're clearly, we clearly have explaining language. Now, on the define answer, let's have a look. Define epoch. Define is what, what, we want, what, what we want there is to give the meaning of something. So if I'm asked to define epoch, I'm going to get nothing for describing it, for explaining it. I'm going to have to give the meaning, the literal definition. So let's put that in. We've already done that. Epoch is a quantity of oxygen consumed post-exercise over and above that which would have been consumed at rest. Now, there's two marks available. So we'd probably get something like consumed post-exercise. didn't mean to do this in orange, actually. It should have been red. That which uh, over and above that which would have been consumed at rest. So I get my two marks. And I move on. Explain why again. So because, therefore, comma, um, this means, and so on and so on. Let's have a go at it. This is because, this is because, so explain why epoch occurs at the end of exercise. This is because the O2 deficit has been built up at the start of exercise, built up at the start of exercise through anaerobic processes and repaid after exercise through aerobic processes. And I get my max. Now that is some fairly straightforward, simple information all of which we have detailed in this process. So if we can understand this, we can have a darn, darn good effort at getting to know recovery pretty well. Okay, so I'm sure there'll be some questions on that. But nevertheless, let's get ourselves ready to, to move on to Epoch. We'll be going back to uh, the studio ever so shortly. Okay, so Epoch, remind yourself, it is the um, excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. Remind yourselves. I wrote it down up here somewhere, didn't I? The excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. Make sure you know that, all right? You need to know that. You need to know that that P is post-exercise, for example. It, the, it literally tells us what it means. Excess, the additional post-exercise, after-exercise, oxygen consumption, amount of oxygen that we consume, the quantity of oxygen... Uh, consumed post-exercise over and above that which would, would have been consumed at rest. It is an exact specific definition of the concept. Okay, so you must be able to uh, undertake that skill and, and describe those things, define those things. So what we want to do now is we want to look at the specifics of the fast and slow component. So let me choose my colors correctly. So here we are going to talk about the fast component. It's the kind of the pinky salmony bit on the graph. We also want to call this the a lactacid a lactacid component. Some of you need to use that term. Some of you don't, by the way, but just know it's exactly the same idea. A lactacid component of epoch. Okay. Now, just something on a lactacid. A, as the prefix means, the non or the opposite. The non-lactacid component. That should make a lot of sense to us. The non-lactacid component. The non-lactacid, the fast component. Okay, so what happens within this process? Okay, what happens within this process? And there's a couple of things I want to draw out with you here. First of all, we get what we would refer to 
when I say first of all, it doesn't necessarily happen first, but we get resaturation, resaturation of myoglobin, of myoglobin with O2. Okay, and this forms oxymyoglobin. And you might want to remind yourself that oxymyoglobin or myoglobin is the product within the muscle which is a store and transporter of oxygen to the mitochondria. Okay, so of course, <clears throat> during our work, we effectively deplete myoglobin of its oxygen coupling. And here we recouple or we resaturate, it's a really nice term for you to use, please. We resaturate myoglobin with oxygen. Now, we have other processes happening in this fast component. We also have the resynthesis, the resynthesis of phosphocreatine. Now you may want to quickly ref reflect that probably the last time you would have studied the ATPPC system, <clears throat> there was a creatine and a phosphogen knocking about uncoupled within the muscle, within the sarcoplasm. And of course, within this fast component, within this um, a lactacid component of EPOC, we resynthesize that phosphogen and creatine back together, and that becomes our kind of 10 second store of explosive energy within the sarcoplasm of the muscle cell. And finally, finally, we also get resynthesis, resynthesis of ATP. And when we're talking about that, we're talking about the th two to three second store that exists in all muscles. So we go through these processes and these processes are the things that's not going to work. These processes are the processes that are happening within that period. I've just kind of outlined really ugly. Okay. Now, that's not to say that it's only that. That's not to say there's no overla uh, overlap with the slow component. Of course, it's not like our biological systems kind of literally go, I've done that first thing, now I'm switching, I'm flicking the switch. No, they overlap and they converge. But the predominant processes in the fast component are these ones. So try and get your head around that. And of course, you've got three specific pieces of terminology and jargon there that let me tell you, you are going to use in your uh, exam responses. So do it. Okay, get that language learned. Now, a couple of other little details. Let me just change uh, colors. Still talking about the fast component, the lactacid component. Things that I like you to know about this <clears throat> is that 50%, 50% PC resynthesis, 50% PC resynthesis takes 30 seconds. Okay, so if we take this point, um, here, resynthesis of phosphocreatine, we're saying that 50% of total resynthesis of our total store takes 30 seconds. Now, that's just kind of a giveaway piece of information. But if we start applying that to weight training, interval training, for example, all of a sudden, or HIIT training, for example, we start to get to an interesting perspective. We get 50% reproduction of our phosphocreatine stores in 30 seconds of recovery. Can we use that in a training and performance application? application can we use that if we are a tennis player and we make sure we get 30 seconds for example between points this is kind of inform you, we might not realize it but this comes out naturally in players performances or uh, in sports people's performances in different genres the other point we can make here is that 100 percent of pc resynthesis 100 percent takes and I've, it depends what textbook you read here but i'm going to give you the figure of two to three minutes now traditionally i would have always said three minutes but i've seen <clears throat> more recently that you can get credit for saying two minutes so i'm just saying something between two to three minutes uh, if you want to check your uh, specification for the exact number that they expect but but those numbers are going to get you uh, going to get you your mark and finally this whole process takes between one to four liters one to four liters of O2. So this entire area as a as a combination would be between one to four liters, one to four, one to four liters of oxygen. One to four liters of oxygen total is what that takes. Now, we of course, <clears throat> excuse me, we of course now want to look at the slow component. Okay, so let's look at the slow component or what we call not surprisingly, the lactacid component, the lactacid component of EPOC. Okay, 
In this case, we've got lact acid, literally means the lactic acid component. Notice we haven't got the A, the non-lactic acid, we've got lact acid component. So what's happening here? Well, it's kind of simpler here. So we're saying basically that <clears throat> we get the removal, removal of lactic acid, more of which in a second the removal of lactic acid. So this area here is all about the removal of lactic acid. And what we're saying basically is that that process, that process, I meant to put, let me do my dot in line, that process there, it can take approximately five minutes, but it can be up to one hour. And this is, of course, up to one hour to remove that lactic acid if we've worked particularly hard anaerobically. So if you start to think about that, it makes really important and um, it makes really intuitive self sense that we do an active cool down. Why? Because we can remove lactic acid faster if we maintain our venous return, if we maintain our uh, distribution of cardiac output to the worked muscle. So an active cool down can reduce this period of time. And finally, this whole process of the lactacid component takes between five to eight liters of oxygen. So this area here, let me choose a decent color to do this. This area here, I don't know how well we've depict, depicted it in our image, but I guess it would kind of carry on a bit. This area here is significantly larger than the red area, the fast component, because it takes between five and eight liters of oxygen to undertake those processes. So that is sort of the crucial information about those two components. Now, what I want to do is I want to think, right, let's let's take Laura. Laura's a really good gymnast. I want to ask the question of where does the lactic acid go in that slow component? Where does lactic acid go? Where does it end up? What do we do with it? And there's a couple of principles before I get into kind of this illustration. There's a couple of principles I'd like you to kind of, I, I'm, those of you that study biochemistry, so do I, but I'm not going that, down that route today. So when we talk in a moment about buffering, when we talk in a moment about glyco and gluconeogenesis, I'm going to be naming those things. So do forgive me for that. I've got numerous videos like on lactic acid buffering. I've got one of my favorite videos I've ever made is on that topic. If you go and have a look at the website, go on to the everlearner.com. And if it's on your course, it's there waiting for you. Okay. But the key point I want to make to you guys is if we think about the production of lactic acid, right, this is in the sort of the exercise moment, lactic acid does not stay in its lactic acid form for any period of time. It breaks down into two things. It breaks down into lactate, okay, and it breaks down into hydrogen. <laughs> it breaks down into hydrogen ion. And it's this hydrogen ion which is effectively the fatiguing poisonous bit, all right? And we remove that stuff, um, including during exercise, in the presence of what we call the bicarbonate, the bicarbonate ion that is produced in the kidney, that is produced in the kidney. And basically what happens is that we produce this bicarbonate, you know, literally that sort of alkaline stuff that we can put in our cakes. We produce this bicarbonate ion, that meant to be ion there, not IO, bicarbonate ion, we produce it in the kidneys and the bicarbonate ion moves through the blood and it picks up these hydrogen ions and it converts it into CO2 and water and we breathe it out. So we get rid of it in that way. Just be aware that there's a stage in between where we form a product called carbonic acid, which sounds like vicious, nasty stuff, doesn't it? But we, when bicarbonate combines with hydrogen iron, it forms carbonic acid, and carbonic acid immediately breaks down into CO2 and water, which we then breathe out at the lung, okay? So basically we breathe the nasty bit out. So the question therefore remains is what do we do with this stuff? And I want you to know that the lactate bit is the energy rich part. It's energy, it's energy rich. Okay, so what happens to that? Well, here's where our illustration now comes in, in handy. So a small amount of that lactate, remember just the lactate, not the lactic acid total, that small amount of that lactate, we literally convert it to protein and, we, and that protein is called urea. And when we form urea, we have two options with that. It can either leave our bodies in the form of sweat or it can leave our bodies in the form of pee. Okay, urination, all right? So we either sweat it out or we pee it out. We can get rid of lactate in that way. But that, in many ways, feels wasteful, 
okay because as we said this is an energy rich product so <clears throat> we've also said as i said a moment ago this is more specifically this part we get rid of it in the form oh sorry let, let me let me rephrase that um, we've actually got an we've actually got an error on our image here okay so this i'd like you to cross that out this is actually a different system okay so i've already told you about that bicarbonate ion so what we should have here is h2o and co2 in this sense with lactate works in a different way so you might remember previously that pyruvic acid becomes lactic acid and it doesn't become things like it doesn't become things like uh, acetyl coa for example if you're not sure what I'm talking about, go and have a look at our session from yesterday. It doesn't become acetyl CoA. It doesn't. It doesn't use citric acid. It doesn't go into the Krebs cycle. But what we're saying with with lactate, we can take our lactate, and we can effectively reverse this. And now that lactate can become acetyl CoA. It can become citric acid. It can move through the Krebs cycle. It can move through the electron transport chain. And what do we produce at the end of that? Other than energy, we produce. H2O and uh, H2O and CO2, so water and carbon dioxide. So we produce those things because we take our lactate and basically we we use it aerobically. Now the other thing we can do is we can take our lactate and make it into glucose. How do we do that? We take our lactate, we convert it back to pyruvic acid, and then we convert it back to glucose. And that is called gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis. And with glycogen, the way that works is we just keep going up the chain and we reconvert it as glycogen and we store it in the muscle and in the liver. And we call that glyconeogenesis. Glyconeogenesis. So that's what we do with lactic acid. Sorry about that confusion there. That shouldn't have been on there. That's my mistake. Okay, so let's have a little look at some questions now that we know what happens to lactic acid. So here we go. <clears throat> Excuse me. Laura's floor routines last for approximately 90 seconds. That sounds about right. And we know that's kind of going to produce that oxygen deficit. It's kind of anaerobic in that point. Describe how Laura is able to remove lactic acid during and after her performance. Now, first of all, we, we've put this question in this way deliberately. And my point to you would be, what is wrong with that question? There is something fundamentally flawed about that question. Are, are you? Do you guys spot it? You teachers out there, do you spot what the flaw in this question is? I'm just gonna just hold fire just for five seconds. Have a look at it again. It is a completely flawed question. We wrote it, by the way, but it's flawed. Not to say you wouldn't get the question, but it's flawed. Does anybody know why? The answer to that is this command, describe how, okay? If we think about describing, we are giving the characteristics. We are giving the composition. But what this question is actually asking us is not that describing stuff. It's asking us to effectively explain how. And you're gonna see this. I would be confident you'll see a wording like this in your exam, describe how. What they actually mean is explain how. And we know that when we explain how, we're using words such as through, by, we might use because, we might use this means, this is the language that we're gonna use, as opposed to describing, which is this is, this is characterized by, this is composed of, this is like the following. So we're gonna explain how. So and I know that's gonna frustrate people, in, but, but we kind of want to prep you. If you get this describe how, it, it's really asking you explain how. Anyway, so explain how Laura is able to remove lactic acid during and after her performance. During and after her performance. So again, we must answer both parts of this. So it's a bit of an analysis as well. Here's my answer. Oof, what, a, what a lot of writing. Let me get my red pen. During performance, I'm addressing that first bit, Laura can remove lactic acid through the buffering system. This means, look, there's my language. This means the bicarbonate ion. Okay, let's say, how many marks have I got for this question? Okay, I've got six marks. Let's say there's three marks, three submax for during and three submax for after. This uh, bicarbonate ion produced in the kidney mops up hydrogen ion. So there's my mark. We're now perhaps going to get a submax because I've done three marks out of the six from during exercise and converts to carbonic acid before being breathed out after exercise. Uh, breathe out so there's my submax there after exercise i'm addressing the other point 
The lactacid component of EPOC removes lactic acid by converting it to protein and by converting it to both glucose, now I've got my max, and of course glycogen could potentially get us a mark if there weren't just six available. So I've cl it clearly done the during, I've clearly done the after, I've clearly put enough content in there to get my marks, and I get my six marks as a, re as a result. And can I remind you what I said before? If you get a describe how question, I mean, first of all, I don't think you should, but if you do, what they mean is explain how use this language here, okay? Because if you used ca the characteristics, the composition, it is, it, it's like, it's not like, you're not gonna get to the to the skill that ultimately they're asking for. Um, sometimes we call this, it's often what we call a false friend, okay? A false friend, it appears to be a describing question, but actually isn't. Now, if you want to ask a question why the exam board wouldn't just put explain how in there, Ask it afterwards when cynicism might not be negative for you. For now, let's just go through the process. Okay, next part. Analyze EPOC, making specific reference to a range of ways that EPOC can be minimized. So now I've got an application of how can I minimize EPOC. Remember, analyzing, what that means, it means to break something down, break something down, and explain it. Okay, so here, what am I gonna break down? Analyze epoch, well, I've got to break down epoch. Well, does epoch have more than one part to it? Oh, that's convenient, we've got at least two parts to epoch, so we can break it down in that way. Let's have a look at how we wrote it. Here we go. Firstly, classic analyze opening. Firstly, comma, here's my first chunk. Firstly, to begin with, uh, in commencement, you know, just say firstly, comma, firstly, comma, the A lactacid component, there's, here's something, I'm naming the A lactacid component. The A lactacid component lasts for up to three minutes. Notice up to three minutes. It lasts for up to three minutes and contributes by resaturating myoglobin, uh, resynthesizing ATP. Okay, and now perhaps I've got a submax. Why? Because I'm not saying about minimizing this. Okay, so now, uh, and by forming creatine phosphate, exactly what I said before. Now, secondly, the lactacid component involves the removal of lactic acid, but the problem is I can't really get another mark for that because I've already got my submax for, for sort of analyzing epoch. Maybe it'd have two submaxes in here. So even though that removal of lactic acid is correct, maybe I've already got the three that's available for analyzing epoch. So what do I have to do now? I have to show about ways that epoch can be minimized. Well, what have I put? Finally, to minimize epoch, comma, finally, comma, to minimize epoch, comma, the athlete must warm up, okay? Because this reduces oxygen deficit they must complete an active cool down and now i'm into my maxes because this maintains venous return and stroke volume this means the muscle remains flushed flushed with oxygenated blood so in other words i've made sure that i've analyzed epoch i've broken it down and explained both parts and i've made sure that i've made reference to a range of ways of minimizing epoch in other words i've taken my knowledge of epoch and used it in the structural reference of the question that's been posed to me. I need to take a breath. I need to sip something. I'll be back to you imminently.